That's why. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to the pre-show show. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I never know if I'm meant to give my name now or later during the show. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm Byron. Genre is on camera. Let's, so we're just doing, checking, making sure we got everything ready and having some fun before the sh the show starts. Um, let's quickly radio Brent to see what he's up to. Good afternoon, mobile stations. Let's see if we can get an update. Copy that, Brent. Uh, confirm reasonably close to Buffalo's or cut line further up uh, Gallego shortcut. Okay, copy, thanks. So we're going to be looking for Inkahuma Pride this afternoon and see if we can find them. And what else? That's it. It's a lovely day. 32 degrees, 32 degrees um, Celsius and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite warm, much warmer than it's been the last few days. But there's a hot wind blowing at the moment. So I wonder if it's going to bring a storm. They say in the next next few days we should get a storm. That would be wonderful. Nice bit of rain. And um, then always, well, Brent, I'm sure, will introduce everyone, depending on who we start the show with. If it's going to be Brent or Jamie, Jamie's going to be walking again this afternoon. wandering around just before our live safari doing our pre-show show and we've switched across from Byron because something something's happening that is happening in final control but we are out on foot once again and hopefully we'll get the vehicles all set up in just a few moments but so far Eggsy's camera seems to be doing well and just so you know for those of you watching the pre-show show we will have three schools joining us first thing this afternoon so for the first 45 minutes our show will be geared towards the kids from the various schools in Virginia Beach which is always exciting and I love it <coughs> and just like that bye bye <laughs> okay, so you're back with us. See, these are the little tests we do. So we jump between presenters occasionally to see if uh, if the others. I don't know what. Uh, maybe just testing sound and that with Jamie. Um, and then we also check our makeup, make sure the sunscreen's all rubbed in. It's all good. <laughs> all good. <laughs> oh, Jandre. Lady in red. The man in green. <laughs> the man in khaki. <laughs> we need to. We need to sing a song. Oh, um, I'm trying to think. You know, put a banana in your ear. No. <laughs> sing. Put a banana in your ear. <laughs> um, Charlie, when you look so down with a big sad frown. The world doesn't have to be so grey. Charlie, when your life's a mess, always in distress. I know it can wash that sad away. Now we go to the chorus, which is what I mean. It's just all you have to do is put a banana in your ear. A banana in my ear? Put a ripe banana right into your favorite ear. It's true, it's so true. And when you're down and feeling blue, sad in the world will disappear when in your ear banana cheers so go. No, oh, there's that smell of the buffalo. Okay, bye everyone. We'll see you later. <laughs> 
This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to the vast African wilderness, an absolutely fantastic way. We're here on foot right now, live in the middle of the African bush. This is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. to all of you joining us on a very special sunset safari and most especially a warm welcome to Lincoln Park Elementary School, North Landing Elementary School and Glenwood Elementary School. I hope you are all really really excited to be joining us on a live safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have a gentleman called Eggsy on camera with me. His real name's not actually Eggsy but Eggsy is what we call him. It's his nickname. Now we are coming to you from a country called a South Africa and we're right up in the top northeastern corner in a massive wilderness area that is bigger than some small countries where all of the wild animals of Africa can roam free without any fences without having to worry about anything. Now there's two of us on the vehicle and I am on foot which is one of the best ways to experience the African bush. Now I want you to imagine I want you to pretend that you've got your hats on because it's very hot this afternoon it is 80 almost 92 degrees Fahrenheit Fahrenheit. If you are, for those of you there, it is in our terms 32 degrees centigrade. So it's a really hot and quite sweaty afternoon. And I'm really glad I'm not carrying the huge backpack that Eggsy's carrying. So now let's imagine that you're right in the middle of the African wilderness. And because this is happening right here and right now, you can ask us questions. So send through your questions, anything you've ever wanted to know about lions and leopards and elephants and anything in between. Uh, we're perfectly safe on foot, just so you know, before we go into my first question, which I'm going to ask you. But before we go into that, just to let you know, we are perfectly safe on foot. We've been doing this for many, many years. We're very aware of what's going on around us, constantly looking, making sure that we don't bump into any of the dangerous animals. Right, I have a question for you to start your brains thinking. I want you to have a look at this massive tree in front of you. Have a look at the scrape marks and the places. Now this tree is missing a huge section of bark. It is called a marula tree. And I want you to see if you can think something came here and something pulled away the layers of bark. And I'm not strong enough and I might actually end up punching eggs in the face if I pull too hard and it goes too quickly and I don't want to do that. So I'm not strong enough to pull the bark away from this tree, but something did and something pulled the bark away all the way up there. What do you suppose that something might have been? Can you tell me what you think ate away some of the tree's bark? Let's see if you can figure that out. Send through your answers. It'll be very, very exciting to hear from you all. Look here. I've got, hmm, I won't ask you this as a question. I will just tell you this is a question. This is, these are the seeds of this particular tree. They're known as marula seeds and something, and I can tell you that it is squirrels, because we have squirrels here as well in South Africa. Squirrels have been eating these seeds. So I'm gonna go off and see what exciting things I can find, and there's all sorts of exciting things to find. Maybe I'll find a snake, maybe an insect, but in the meantime, it's not just myself out here, and I know that Byron is just dying to say hello to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and look what we have just found. We've got a pride of lions. 
Wonderful, wonderful. We were looking for them this morning. We didn't find them, but we found them now. And hello, everybody. My name is Byron, and on camera with me this afternoon is Jandre. Hello to all the schools that are watching too, and the little kids. It's wonderful to have you. Don't forget to send us your questions. Now, we're sitting with this beautiful pride of lions, the Unkahuma pride, which is a pride that we see regularly on Juma and on Safari Live. And um, they're just resting in the shade. It's a very, very hot day, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very hot. And these lions are doing what lions do best during the day, is resting in the shade. Vaisha from Glenwood. Hello, Vaisha. Lovely to have you with us on Safari Live. You'd like to know how many animals are there in Africa, and there are plenty. There are millions of animals in Africa, um, all over. Africa is a very, very large country, um, continent. Where we are, and um, where we are at the moment in South Africa, we've got a number of game reserves or nature reserves around South Africa that protect the animals, and these animals are completely wild. They live in the wild we don't interfere with them at all and I'm trying to think now also thousands of different animal species um, throughout South Africa as well many many different species um, and then thousands of numbers of them within for example I think in the in the greater Kruger National Park where we are probably got about um, between a thousand and three thousand lions I think in the National Park so a huge amount of predators around but it's very difficult to give you an exact number how many animals there are in Africa. There are millions of them. Malik, you want to know from, um, how the animals escape the heat. So Malik, what they do is they, as we can see what these lions are doing, they're lying in the shade and they'll stay in the shade during the day because it's very, very hot. So they'll lie in the shade and luckily for them there's a nice cool breeze at the moment. So it helps cool them down a little bit. And, uh, and that is how one of the ways the animals can escape the heat. The other way is for some of the other animals like the buffalo or the elephant and what they like to do is they'll go to the water holes and they'll bathe themselves in mud. That's right, they throw mud all over their bodies, help cools them down and also splash water over themselves. So that does help too, but the lions won't do that. They don't like the, the water too much. They don't necessarily go into water unless they have to. Oh, look at that cub, everyone. Maddie, all the way from North Landing. Um, hello, Maddie. You wanted to know what, times do the, what time do the lions go to sleep? So, Maddie, funnily enough, these lions don't have to go to sleep, really. And what they do is they are mostly active at night. So when we all sleeping during the evening, that's when the lions are moving around a lot. And... Um, and this is probably the best time for them to rest. So what they do is they have these afternoon naps or this time to rest and um, and they conserve their energy. So they save their energy and later when the temperature starts cooling down and, uh, and it starts getting dark, then these lions will start waking up and moving around a lot more. But they do move around during the day too. question from Mrs. Mervyn's class from Linkhorn. Um, you wanted to know what time will the lions wake up in the evening? So it, it's difficult to say. Um, there isn't a specific time and the reason for that is if the lions are thirsty or if they're hungry they'll get up any time to go and start moving around. Generally they prefer when it is cooler, when the temperature has dropped. So I think um, 
maybe six o'clock in the evening seven o'clock around about there it can be earlier there's no exact time and that's the thing that's so wonderful about watching these wild animals is there's no specific answer for any of these questions these animals are wild they'll do whatever they want whenever they want which is very exciting so we can never always guarantee what time they're going to wake up or move around Chloe, you've asked uh, how many lions are in the group. Um, let's just have a look here, Chloe. I actually haven't counted yet. Let's double check. I can see oh, there's a few at the back. Looks like one, two, three, four. Oh. I think I see four lionesses. And I can only see one or two cubs at the moment but everyone it is very thick here i cannot see all the way to the back there are some lying further back i can only see four females and about two two or three cubs at the moment but i wouldn't be surprised if they're more dotted around through the back it's a bit difficult to see at the moment it is very very thick here um this pride generally has five females and um, and six cubs at the moment so I'm not too sure if they are all here currently but they could be we're going to try and sit here a little bit longer with these lions see what they get up to let's head back to Jamie and uh, see what she has on her walk look at what we have found now, this particular creepy crawly is very beautiful and it's known as a centipede. Uh, oh, and he's gone into a hole and he's disappearing. Oh, he's going for your eggs. <laughs> and Eggsy is very wisely moving. Look at how quick this thing moves. Look at it, all of those legs working together. Now, I don't want to scare it too much, so when it goes into that hole, we're going to leave it alone. We're not going to make it any more scared because, of course, all of these animals are more scared of us than we are of them but this is a particularly interesting little creature now some of you will know how I feel about centipedes and I have to be honest I'm not scared of snakes I'm not scared of spiders I'm not scared of scorpions but I don't really like seeing centipedes I think it's something in the way that they move they also have a really very sore bite now they are little carnivores so they're carnivorous arthropods in other words that's the same family and the same order as the insects they're carnivorous unlike millipedes which are absolutely harmless and they also have a relatively toxic bite so they actually do carry some venom that makes their bite very very sore and makes you feel a little bit peculiar afterwards you feel a bit funny you feel a bit shaky it's not strong enough to kill you but it is a little bit unpleasant which is why I wasn't shouting at Eggsy for moving the camera and for running away a little bit and you see that incredibly bright color wasn't that a beautiful now, Michaela, you want to know what are all of the animals' habitats. Well, Michaela, we've got so many different types of animals, just like that centipede, and it is an animal, just like the mammals. Now, for that centipede, this is its habitat. These are bits of old tree and bark, and we'll leave the centipede alone for now. These bits of old bark, you can see there's lots and lots of layers where they can hide underneath, and that's all the centipede wants to do, is it wants to hide away. There's some nice holes, secret places where it could sneak in. And this is the perfect habitat for insects, spiders, beetles, all sorts of things you can find under old and rotten wood out here. Now, you've got to be careful whenever you come into, if you ever come to visit the African bush, don't go putting pulling apart the bark because otherwise you could risk being bitten by a snake. Then we've got these massive open areas where the impala and the different antelope like to be and of course we've got animals living all around us because we do live and work exactly where we are at the moment. Vincent you want to know if it's hard to sleep when we have all of the noises of the animals. Honestly Vincent it's much much quieter here than it is in a big city. So yes we get the lions roaring and sometimes we hear the leopards sawing and the birds calling but they're really nice sounds and it gets actually very easy to get used to them we don't have to worry about the sound of traffic we don't have to worry about the sounds of ambulances or anything like that 
So there you go. Chris, you wanted to know if there are any leopards. Chris, yes, there are. And we've actually been really lucky. Just yesterday, Chris, a leopard mom and her two cubs walked right past our house where we live and where we sleep every night. She's got two gorgeous little nine-month-old cubs. Now, unfortunately, it seems like she might have gone outside of where we can drive, but there are lots and lots of leopards in this area, so we could even see one while we're walking around, although most of the time, your, the leopards will actually hide away from you. So that's one of the really cool things. Now I mentioned earlier before we get too far away because I see some more evidence on that tree over there. Now one of you answered that it was a rhino perhaps that had done that to it to the tree. Uh, it was a good answer and some really good thinking but that whatever did that to the tree was even taller even taller than a rhino. Okay, you well done. Very, very good answer. Yes, the termites did eat the bark. They did start to eat the bark, but something else helped them, and actually something started that process of pulling the part of the bark away from the tree. So what could it be? Something even bigger than a rhino, something even heavier than a rhino, that can reach much, much higher than a rhino. What do you think that might be? Oh, we're looking at animals' homes. Come and have a look here. Look at all of these holes in the ground. This could well be an animal's home. Now, Kay, you mentioned termites, and yes, this is an old termite mound where the termites will, most of them are living underground, doing whatever it is they do, but it gets really very hot in a termite mound, underground, kind of like a mine. So what they have to do is they have to create these holes that come all the way up to the top of the ground so that the air can flow in and cool them down. Now, that's where the termites live, but at the moment, why do you think it would be a really very bad idea to stick your hand into one of these holes? Because it's very dark down here. I don't have a torch and the sun's not quite at the right angle for you to see in, but the hole goes right down deep. Why do you think you might not want to stick your hand down there? And those of you who are thinking it might not be a very good idea, well done. Yes, you definitely shouldn't because there could even be a snake hiding away in there waiting until it gets a little bit cooler. So we're focusing on the little things, but of course Byron's got those really exciting lions. Let's jump on board with him and see what the lions are up to. And look at this, everybody. Now, there are all six cubs now. They've come out the bushes. They were lying just to the back. Um, in, in the thicket, probably in the shade, and they've come down and they're rubbing up against the females and they're making quite a lot of noise. Let's see here if we can hear some of those sounds. And as I say that, they keep quiet. <laughs> Hang on, there we go. There's there we go, listen, listen, little sounds. Kaylee from North Landing, you'd like to know, or you say that cats generally don't like water. Do some of the big cats like water? And Kaylee, yes, they, well, I wouldn't say they like water, but in some parts of Africa, there's a lot of water around and there's some big rivers. And these animals like the lions, for example, these big cats will definitely cross the rivers if they have to, and they'll wander through some, uh, some deep water. Um, so even though they don't necessarily like the water, if they have to, they will. And I've seen lions cross rivers and walk through deep water before. So yes. Whew. Karis from North Landing, you wanted to know where the male lion is and why isn't he around? So in this area, we've got 
some males. They're actually a four males, a coalition of four. It's four brothers that stay together. Now those males have a big territory or big home and what they do is they constantly move around to protect the area from other lions um, and to protect the prides but they will belong and move between different groups of lionesses not just this one so those males are probably just moving around maybe with some other lionesses so that's the benefit um, of ha them having a very large territory listen to these cubs everyone Uh, Logan, you want to know how far can a lion's roar travel? So Logan, probably about, probably about six miles away. I think you can probably hear a lion roar from about six miles away, which is about ten kilometers or so. There's a smell of a carcass in the area, everyone, and. These lions have been hunting buffalo recently. I don't see one around here, but I can smell it. Very, very strong, strong smell. Not a very pleasant smell. So Tamron, you want to know how old these lions are? The little cubs are about, the little cubs are, I think they, uh, Cameron, sorry, Cameron, uh, you wanted to know how old the cubs are, and um, these cubs are about eight to nine months old now, going on nine months, so, um, so it's a, a good age, and the lionesses, um, I'm not entirely sure that because I think there's there's different ages within these lionesses There are some younger females some older females. I'm not entirely sure how old these lionesses are. I Think they're between the ages of about 8 and 10 I think somewhere around there and then I think there's one or two that are younger that but four or five years old if I'm not mistaken But I'm not entirely sure Cameron, but those cubs are about nine months old. No, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, these cubs are younger, Cameron. No, I'm just uh, thinking. I think they're only only five or six months old, if I'm not mistaken. Sure, can't remember when last I saw them, when uh, or when when they were born. I think they were born in June, if I'm not mistaken. June, so July, August, September, October, November. So about five months. Miguel from North Landing, you want to know how big is a lion's territory? So a big male lion, Miguel, can have a very, very large area. Maybe, oh, now I need to think of my conversions. Um, oh dear, I'm not very good at this. So we use kilometers out here, and I know you use miles back home, but um, it'll probably be about four or five miles by about four or five miles somewhere around there so if you can imagine how large that is it's a large area but probably even bigger that would be a, an average size territory i would say for a male line it can be much bigger so um, probably about you know somewhere somewhere around there So no, from Lincoln, you wanted to know what do the cubs do to help the pride? So no, at this age, they won't necessarily do anything. The females do all the hunting until these cubs get a bit older. So about two, two years old, maybe two and a half years old, they'll start helping with hunting. But not yet, they're still very, very young. So all the hunting is done by these females and they will provide food for the little cubs. All right, 
and we're going to sit with these lines a little bit longer. Jamie's trying to get something out of a hole. Let's go see what she's got. Well, I heard that one of you would really, really like to see a scorpion. Well, we found a centipede, and now I found the home that scorpions live in. And that is this tiny little hole here in the ground. So, Rohan, you wanted to see a scorpion. Oh, Rohan, the scorpion is currently, most of our scorpion species are sleeping because they are nocturnal. In other words, they only come out at night. But the reason that I know that this is a scorpion hole, and I'm just going to show you ever so gently is the shape of it so rather than being just a hole in the ground remember we looked at the holes earlier it sort of looks like a squashed circle so this part is flat this part is longer than the height and you can actually see see all of this fresh dirt that the scorpion has scraped up that's him digging to go underneath the ground to sleep for the night so whenever you see a hole that is shaped like how can i show you this maybe if i wasn't in the sun it would also help but if ever you see a hole that is shaped like this See what I mean? It's it's not really round, it's more like an oval shape with the top that's much flatter, the height is much shorter than the width of the hole. Then out here you know immediately that that is a home of a scorpion. And a very well done to Liam and to Logan for getting that it was an elephant that did that to that tree. Very, very well done. You're very clever. And we'll go, when we next see one of those trees, I'll explain to you exactly how um, elephants go about it. Now, Aubrey from Lincoln Park, you want to know how many ecosystems there are in the African bush. Well, there are an amazing amount. Sometimes just one dead tree can be an entire ecosystem system all of its own because of course it's the, the, the tree itself the insects in the bark the birds that are living there so there's actually more ecosystems out here than we can count but we've got a lot of very different habitats and we're about to walk into one of those different habitats right now so we've just come from this really quite clear area so if I oh, yeah, time to stand up can't spend the whole afternoon sitting down so we've come from what was a relatively open area with some big trees some beautiful big marula trees. Now we're going into some really dense vegetation. So this is a completely different habitat, a completely different type of vegetation than anywhere else that we are, or than other different places on this reserve. So you might have places where there's a river, and of course when you've got a river, you've got really big trees here, different types of grasses, different types of vegetation and all sorts of interesting things like that and even wait let's maybe use this as an example in a way even a pile of old elephant dung like this one so this is old old elephant dung it's not fresh at all this is probably this could be even up to a year or so old judging by the white color but even an a pile of dung like this can actually start turning into an ecosystem in its own way because of course you've got a network of termites the termites are moved in they're starting to break down the elephant dung you might have dung beetles because yes we get some we get a very special type of beetle out here that is called a dung beetle now let's go and here you might get the dung beetles and the termites together in separate parts of the dung. Mackenzie, you want to know if the animals get along with each other. Sometimes, but not always. So these are wild animals. They've got to struggle to survive. Some of them have got to hunt to, to live. They've got to hunt to find their own food. Some of them have to compete with others over what they can eat or where, where they can drink. So not always. They don't always get along very well. So things like leopards and lions, for example, or maybe lions and hyenas, they often come into conflict. And it's really important to remember that animals aren't doing it on purpose. It's not because they don't like each other. It's because it's all part of survival. And they know that if that animal does well, then they might not do as well. So it's a really difficult... It's, it's a difficult life for them. Sorry, I nearly walked straight into Eggsy there. It's because I want to show you something. And even the trees have to adopt different approaches for survival. And just look at 
this, these incredible thorns. This is one way that a, def that a tree is able to defend itself from being fed upon by things like elephants, for example. Although, to be honest, elephants' mouths are so tough that they could actually take a whole clump of thorns like this and crunch it. I'm not going to do that because I'm not an elephant and that would really, really hurt. So I'm not going to do that. But each and everything out here is very... Ow! Stop freaking me! <laughs> I'm trying to show you how long these thorns are. Look how long that is. It's almost as... It's actually longer than my finger and really very thick. So everything out here is fighting for survival in one way or another. Sometimes you've got animals that get on really well with each other. Like, for example, there's a bird, a type of bird called an oxpecker. Now, an oxpecker comes fluttering along and it sits on another animal and it picks off the ticks and the itchy things that might be sitting on that animal's fur. And then that oxpecker gets a safe place to hide because it's sitting on the back of a big animal like a buffalo and it also gets a free food. Now speaking of free food, that's something that our lions definitely most likely wouldn't turn their nose up at. Let's go across to Byron and have a look at them. Free food? I don't have any free food, Jamie. <laughs> I've got lions though. <laughs> Miles from Lincoln, you want to know if the lions have got ticks on them? Yes, Miles, um, there probably may be some ticks that, that uh, crawl onto the lions and sit on the lions. However, however, these lions do clean themselves very, very carefully and the pride will clean one another. So they try and clean the ticks off. You can actually see that little cub licking himself over there. And that would be a good way of trying to clean the ticks off of them. And they're a lot better at cleaning themselves and getting the ticks off of them as opposed to some of the other animals. Do lions provide food for their cubs around it? They do indeed, yes. So these lionesses at the moment, they would go off and they would do all the hunting. So they will try and catch a buffalo maybe or an antelope. And with them doing that hunting, they then will come and collect the cubs. So they come, they actually call the cubs. They'll hide the cubs somewhere, come back, call them and take them to where the food is so that they can all feed together and have some meat. But some of these little cubs will still be trying to suckle from the mothers so they will so they will still try and um, and get some milk from the females Ariana you wanted to know if the male lions will hunt like the females yes they do now a lot of people think that it's only the female lions that hunt but that's not true the males especially if they're not with the pride they will have to hunt for themselves otherwise they're not going to eat so yes they do indeed hunt for themselves and um, and especially if these lionesses are hunting something big like maybe a buffalo which is very strong and powerful the males will come in and help and they will help bring down the buffalo to eat oh look everybody the lioness is getting up let's see where she's going she might just change her position a little bit and lie down again in the shade isn't she beautiful there we go <laughs> Laurel, you wanted to know why did the cubs wake the mothers up? So Laurel, the chances are probably just for a bit of attention maybe, or I think they were looking to see if there's perhaps some milk that they can suckle from their mothers. And I think that's exactly, let's see, this little cub's walking over to this female now. Let's see what it does. Oh, look at that. And listen, listen everybody. You see, I think, yeah, the little cub's looking for milk, you see? So that answers your question right there, Laurel. That the little cub wants some milk.
Ari, you wanted to know how many cubs are there usually in a pride of lions? So Ari, it's, it's difficult to say, there's not always an exact number, but what happens is the females can give birth to anywhere between one or four cubs. That's usually the, the average for, for a lioness. So over here at the moment we've got uh, well, we've got f um, five lionesses. So it depends how many cubs they each gave birth to. Um, over here at the moment um, they're just the six cubs, but um, but it depends. You know, one lioness can give just give birth to one one cub. Others can give birth to four cubs. That would increase the numbers. So again, it's very difficult to give an exact number. Madison from Glenwood, do you want to know how old will a male lion be when he starts to grow that beautiful big mane? So Madison, you can actually see the little tufts of hair starting to grow or form from two years old already, but that big mane is usually or usually fills out at about about five years old. I would say that's an average five, six years old. Then they get a beautiful full mane, which is lovely to see with these big males. <laughs> uh, Nicholas, you want to know what is the lion's scientific name? Good question, Nicholas. Oh dear, and the scientific names are usually very, very difficult, but luckily the lions, it's not so difficult. The scientific name of a lion is Panthera Leo. That's the scientific name of, uh, of a lion, Panthera, because it forms part of the uh, Panthera genus and the species Leo, which is lion. So Panthera Leo. But that's a very difficult question, sure. Some big words there, even for me. <laughs> Jackson, you want to know why don't lions migrate? So Jackson, thing is at the moment, getting a smell of that buffalo again everyone, very strong. So um, um, Jackson, the reason is that these lions don't have to migrate because they don't look for food like antelope species or other animals that eat vegetation or grass and leaves. They don't have to worry about that. So if it gets dry and there isn't a lot of leaves or grass around, they only eat other animals. So um, herbivores like um, impala or, or uh, buffalo, for example, that's just two examples, but they'll eat a number of different species. So the thing is, they don't have to migrate because there's generally always food around for them. And as long as there's a bit of water, they don't need to. And down here, where we are in Africa, we're right down at the southern part of Africa. Now, we don't see migrations like you see in East Africa. So that's up Kenya and Tanzania. And, um, and th those areas, those animals migrate a lot looking for food and water. Water, whereas here there's generally always food and water around. And Cecilia from Lincoln, you wanted to know, do we get to touch the lions? No, we don't, not at all. These are wild, wild lions. So we're very lucky that we get to see them, but we would never get too close and definitely not try and try and touch them because and especially with these little cubs around, these females would be very, very protective and we can find ourselves in some serious trouble if we try to touch them. There comes another cub, you see, all trying to suckle and get some milk. Oh, look at that. And you wanted to know how do lions communicate with other animals? So lions wouldn't necessarily want to communicate with other animals at all. Um, the only time lions communicate and where other animals know that there are lions around is when the lions are roaring, when they're giving off their very, very big roar to warn other lions that they are in the area. 
or if uh, um, if they're trying to find one another so communicating with each other and that's the only time other animals will know that their lions around but they don't necessarily communicate with other animals you want to know how do the cubs learn to hunt so the females will teach them and what happens is while these cubs when they get a little bit older they'll start following the females a lot more when they are hunting and uh, and they'll start learning that way so they'll watch the females and they'll see what the females do when they do come across something to eat and then that's how they learn so it's all about watching and learning and also the cubs get very playful they, um, they, they will uh, they'll jump on one another and wrestle and all of that is, is a way for them to, uh, to learn how to attack or pull down prey. So all of that is a learning process for these lions. Bless you. Sandra <laughs> is sneezing. Maybe he's allergic to cats. <laughs> Madison, lions don't necessarily abandon their cubs. No, it is very, very seldom that that would happen. I have seen it happen before, um, but but generally they don't. They w they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't want to um, want to abandon their cubs unless it's a situation where they really don't have food or water, and the lionesses are struggling maybe, and they can't look after the cubs. Then maybe they would, but generally that doesn't happen. Isn't this a wonderful, wonderful sighting? His lionesses have got their heads up, and then one just drops down. <laughs> but uh, but so nice to see the whole pride together. And this is a lovely, lovely Monday for us. We're going to sit here a little bit longer with these beautiful lions. Let's head back to Jamie, who's still walking around. Let's see what she's got now. Remember how exciting I told you it was to be out on foot? And that's because when you're driving around in the vehicle, you're not always paying attention to the smaller things. And just have a look at this amazing fella. Whatever it may be, we know it's a hairy caterpillar, but I don't know whether it's going to turn into a moth or a butterfly, but isn't it absolutely incredible? Now, this is something that you really, 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 really don't want to have on your skin or to touch, because the reason it's called a hairy caterpillar and the reason it has these fine, fine hairs is a defense mechanism to stop most of the birds out here from eating them. Because imagine a sitting target, a bird could come down, pluck the caterpillar up and off it goes. So what this clever caterpillar has learned to do or has evolved to do is it has these very, very fine hairs on the growing off its skin. And if you happen to touch it or pick it up, and I think all of us as kids growing up in South Africa, I'm sure Eggsy's encountered one or two in his time. I have as well. Sometimes they've even been in my clothes. And when those little hairs that are so fine, you can barely see them, thinner than even some of your hairs, when those hairs get embedded in your skin it becomes <coughs> excuse me it becomes very 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 itchy so itchy that you don't know what to do with yourself and it's really hard to get them out now, Imani, you wanted to know if centipedes can hurt animals. Centipedes can hurt animals. So this is a caterpillar, which is different from the centipede that we saw earlier. A centipede can hurt animals because it's got that very, very strong bite and it's got venom. Now, centipedes actually hunt scorpions. Sometimes scorpions hunt and eat centipedes and sometimes centipedes hunt and catch and eat scorpions. It just depends on which one is bigger at the time. But a caterpillar like this, 
this isn't going to hurt you at all. It's just going to make you really, really itchy and your skin will probably come up in a welt, kind of like maybe you'd encountered some stinging nettles or something similar like that. Uh, Sadie, you want to know what are the chances of seeing a venomous animal. This one isn't a venomous animal, but relatively high. And in fact, Sadie, believe it or not, you've already seen one because that centipede that we saw earlier is venomous. However, we have found snakes on bushwalk before, and that's always incredible. Now, I'm not a hands up if you're afraid of a snake. How many of you are scared of snakes? Perhaps you find them a little bit freaky. Maybe it's the way that they move. Our snakes are actually not that scary as long as you get to know them. And it turns out out that nine times out of ten if somebody is bitten by a snake it's because they were playing with it or trying to catch it and they just didn't know what they were doing so a lot of the time or in fact all of the time the snake is more afraid of you than they than we are of them and it's just important to treat them with enough space and respect so that they don't feel threatened and then they're not going to bite you but there's a good chance that we could find a snake we could find a scorpion we've been looking for scorpions there's a gentleman called Herbert with me as well now Herbert's job is to walk ahead in front of me because of course I'm talking to you I've got this earpiece so I can listen to your questions so I can't concentrate all the time on making sure that I'm not walking into something like a buffalo or an elephant. So Herbie walks ahead and he helps us find the amazing stuff that we see and he's been looking for scorpions for you. So there's a good chance. But while we're here, I have to stand up again. Let me show you some other things that we can see. Now, David, you wanted to know how old a scorpion could get, and here's a good place to start looking for a scorpion. One might be hidden in the bark, maybe, or somewhere around here. But while I look for a scorpion, I'm going to show you some interesting leaves. And David, you wanted to know how old a scorpion can get. Well, some of the biggest species of scorpion, David, can actually live to be a couple of years old. So sort of, you're looking at around five to six, maybe even longer. I'm actually not sure if any of them live any longer longer than that, but they can live for quite a few years. So it's not like a fly, for example, that could die, you know, in a, the space of 24 hours. Why am I picking these leaves? Well, I want to teach you something very, very cool. If you ever find yourself out in the bush and perhaps you're not feeling too well, perhaps your tummy isn't feeling too well and you desperately have to go to the bathroom and you don't have anything with you, this is the best thing. And that's why we call this tree the toilet paper tree because it's got really very soft leaves and there are no thorns so you can use it like toilet paper if you have to. Oh, unfortunately, we haven't found any time to, well, we haven't found any venomous creatures for you, which means you'll just have to join us for the next time that we go out on safari. But apparently it's time for us to say goodbye to all of our schools, so I hope you have a fantastic day further and that your rest of your school day is, ex is as exciting as this was. And I hope to see you again once more in the future. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> So we're still sitting with these lions, everyone. And I know the little school has left us. or well, the schools, rather. There were three schools watching, which is great. Always nice having these, these young kids watching and sending through their questions. Um, so um, for a lot of our regular viewers, um, we did check, and I'm not sure if you did here, but all, all six cubs are here at the moment. So all six cubs, but I've only counted four lionesses. One, two, three, four, still. I don't know, Jandre, if you've seen another one or pop up somewhere. Um, uh, no. No, f um, f no, all five lionesses are here. I apologize. Yeah, all five lionesses are here and all six cubs. The four of them were lying off in the distance and I think they were lying with one uh, one lioness and then they got up and came and joined the rest of the pride. Probably just hiding in the shade somewhere.
This is fantastic. What a what a lovely Monday afternoon. I hope all of you are enjoying it. If you're watching from work, I know um, I know quite a few of my guests and friends and um, are sitting in their office watching and and um, just don't get caught. <laughs> um, yeah, Claire, I know you might be watching. Don't get caught at work. Stephen from Belgium, you wanted to know what kind of subspecies of lions are these? They aren't a subspecies, this is the African species of lion. Um, and you wanted to know what their major threats are. And generally with lions, it's other lions. That would be the only threat. Um, other lions coming in, challenging for territory, challenging for dominance, killing each other, killing cubs. That would usually be it. Hyenas, perhaps, at a kill. If uh, if the hyenas really outnumber lions, then the chances are they could potentially be injured, badly wounded. The hyenas would attack them. Um, oh, sorry, everyone. We keep getting this whiff. There's a buffalo carcass near here somewhere. And um, every now and then, the strong smell comes through. And then also, unfortunately, at the moment, what's been threatening these lions are diseases. And that's been caused by the drought, mainly by the drought. So um, there's been some white muscle disease, and there's also been some, um, some mange, which has affected some of the lions. So those are threats, but they're not frequent threats at all. But they do occur, depending on times of, of drought and when they, are, when they are experiencing bad conditions. But that's nature's way. I think of keeping a balance and even though it's very hard to see we need to understand that it is nature we don't interfere it is part of being a lion it's part of being an antelope that's just nature's way of maintaining a balance with numbers in these natural environments Gee, that, <laughs> that smell keeps coming through <laughs> smell of ripe buffalo Eesh. Uh, Selena, you wanted to know, do we know if lions grieve for the loss of a pride member? Um, Selena, I, I find this quite tricky, and I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because I, I definitely think that they, they do recognize the loss of a cub, um, especially a cub lioness. I've seen in the past where they go and they look and they call for them and they try and find if those cubs are still around, but then they move on again. They don't stay for very long. Whether or not they grieve, I'm not entirely sure. And um, a lot of people may disagree with me, but I personally, and this, this again is just my, my personal thoughts and opinions, is that um, it's very difficult for us um, to anthropomorphize these animals and give them human feelings and emotions. I think there's a fine line that we, we need to be careful of crossing because we don't really know how they feel or what they what they are experiencing. As I said, I've seen lions, lionesses go, they call and they look for cubs when they have lost one, but they spend maybe a day doing it and then they move on and they continue their lives. So uh, grief, I, I don't know, but recognizing the loss definitely who knows I, i'm just saying you know that that's my opinion is that we just need to be careful of trying to give them too many human emotions because it, they are wild animals at the end of the day and i don't think we really really understand what they are feeling We're going to sit here for a while longer with these lions. And Jamie's still walking around. I think she's got something interesting to show you. 
Now, while a Byron sits with the incredible in Kahumas, we've been strolling along and Eggsy and myself and Herbie just taking a brief break and allowing the breeze to blow over us because it is quite warm. And one thing that I've noticed is that on bushwalk on cold and cloudy days, your chances of finding the more spectacular types of insect life are greatly heightened than on a day like today where almost everything has gone completely still, completely quiet. And we're moving quite slowly through the vegetation here just because it is quite thick and the wind is blowing very, very strongly. Now luckily it's blowing our scent towards everything in front of us, everything that we're moving towards, which is great because it means that they'll be aware of us, we're not going to surprise anything. Usually on windy days you have to be slightly more careful. But what strikes me here, just walking through this area, and it's the same, you know, it'll, you'll always find uh, that an area looks like this, but it's particularly pronounced after the drought. There's a black-bellied, sorry, before I go into that, there's a black-bellied busted call, or calling, somewhere not too far away from us. And I've just heard Herbie give an impression of a black-bellied busted. And let me tell you something, he beats us all hands down when it comes to mimicking a black-bellied busted call. It sounds exactly like that, doesn't it, Igzy? Yeah. It's quite incredible. He's run away now, otherwise I would, I would make him come over here and show you. I would not make him, I'd ask him to come over here and show you. What I was going to point out was just the sheer amount of elephant destruction in just a small area. And it's going to be very interesting to get an idea as to just how much the shape and the, the face of a landscape has changed just due to the drought. Now we've been walking on a path and, and um, Herbie actually pointed it out to me. We've been walking along an elephant path and we've just come off it now. That elephant path he says was made by, it hasn't been here before. So it was, he's obviously walked these places flat. He says it's been made in less than a day. He thinks it was just one elephant herd moving through an area. So they have a tremendous impact on the vegetation around them. And if we just stand here and we sort of do a 360, this massive bush willow on its side, that massive bush willow on its side, all of these have been fed on in some way. We've got the bush willow that is now flat and then a bush willow slightly off to the left that's an angle. So the amount of elephant devastation, I mean, we can do a full 360, I suppose. These, these trees have made it out relatively sort of intact. And then we've got another massive, massive bush willow down on its side as well. And what we're walking in is bush willow woodland, so we'd expect most of the damage to be bush willow. And what's going to happen if, if the sort of the vegetation follows a natural healing process, these fallen areas provide the perfect place. They actually act as a seed bank. So they help the grasses to recover, which is exactly what they need to, because after the drought, the trees have come out relatively, relatively unscathed, you know, apart from that poor one that's been knocked over by an elephant. But the grasses, the grasses and the plants, the perennial and the annual plants are what have been really hard hit. And so these seed banks might seem like it's a destructive thing that the elephants have pushed over all of these trees, but they've actually allowed the grasses a place, a really safe place to grow and to recover without being trodden on by 10,000 buffalo that come through here every year or without being nibbled up by all of the hippo and so on. And eventually what will happen is the tree will rot away, but the grass covers recovered underneath. And it also provides, it opens up the bush, like, and we're in some quite dense vegetation at the moment, it opens up the bush so that the sun can get down to the grass and as a result you've got that balance re-established between your grass and your tree layer. So they play an, an invaluable part of our ecosystem. So as we trundle along and see if we can find anything that's awake this afternoon, it seems as though Byron's lions are doing a fantastic job of having an afternoon snooze. Let's go and join them. And these lions are still snoozing. They've really all settled down now. I don't think we're going to stay here for much longer, everybody, because it looks like they're very comfortable and it is still very, very hot. I may try to come past a little bit later, but...
Hannah. Um, and Hannah, age nine, lovely to have you with us. Hannah, I hope you're enjoying watching these little cubs. You wanted to know um, if it's sore for the mothers or these lionesses when these cubs do suckle. I don't think when they are suckling at the moment that it does hurt them, but sometimes those little teeth are very sharp and it can be a little bit painful. But you'll see the females will probably, um, probably growl and chase the little cub off. Sorry, some flies around here at the moment. <laughs> And a question from I walk in the rain you would like to know what age are the cubs weaned so they're already starting to feed on meat and we've seen that from about two to three months they start feeding on meat already but um, but for them to be completely weaned you know some of these cubs still try their luck even up to a year old but uh, but generally uh, around six to eight months then they, they usually get pushed away from the mothers um, and a little bit older then the females do get a bit upset with them and try and get up and walk away when they are trying to suckle now look at this little one trying to get in there to get um, uh, to suckle from the mother <laughs> bit of a bit of a fight there is that amazing <laughs> Lovely, lovely breeze at the moment. It's been quite windy today. This, I, I wonder if it's not just a hot berg wind, which has been coming down from the from the Drakensberg, which is to our west, probably about um, uh, 100 kilometres or so, 80 80 kilometres or so, which is what's that about 50 50 odd miles, 50 60 miles somewhere around there to our west and these hot berg winds flow or blow down during this time of year and hopefully bring rain <clears throat> so we'll see now I always tell my guests this but you know sitting with lions you know, when they are resting, you always think, well, and I've heard people say this before, but lions are lazy, but they are not lazy, everyone, not at all. And look how quickly that lioness jumped up. I wonder what she heard or what she saw. So they are definitely not lazy. They are clever because they rest and they conserve their energy for later in the evening, especially when they start moving around a lot more. But, uh, but the thing with the lions is, even though they look like they are fast asleep or resting, I promise you if I had to step off this vehicle now, these lions would be up in a flash. They're incredibly alert and aware of what's going on around them. And we've seen now a few times these lionesses have lifted their heads and looked around and possibly heard something, something that we maybe haven't heard. And it's just alerted them and they're looking around to make sure there's no threat or danger or if there's potential food around. Lionheart, you wanted to know if they've eaten another buffalo. Um, I don't think they ate one yesterday. Uh, to be honest, no, I don't think they ate one yesterday, but the day before they did have one again. Um, so I'm not, not too sure, not recently as far as I know, but I mean we didn't see them this morning so I don't think they were feeding on anything. We found a buffalo carcass not far from here and we, I mean we can still smell it but nothing fed on it. It looked like that buffalo had died from natural causes and I know the buffalo have been struggling with the drought at the moment but uh, it doesn't appear as if these lions fed on a buffalo today. And the bellies don't look that full, so I don't think yesterday either or last night, I don't think they fed on one. Mm, Alright, 
we've had a wonderful wonderful view of these lions but they are resting now and i think uh, we're going to continue see what else we can find and while i move out and hit the road let's head back to jamie on her walk and see what she has got well, speaking of other things, we've just come upon a massive herd of kudu. And I'm going to see if we can get a view of them if we move a little bit closer to the termite mound. And they know that we're here, so I don't want to pretend or to, to whisper as though we haven't been seen, because that's immediately going to put them on edge and make them feel as though we are in some way trying to sneak up on them, which of course we aren't, are we girls? So there we go, we might get a view of, as soon as I step out into the open, there's a good chance they're going to run away. Can you see them there, Eggsy? A pair of kudu watching us with their radar-like ears. Aren't they beautiful? And these are the moments that I love on foot. Sometimes it just gives you a far better perspective as to just sort of the way that these animals live and sort of puts you more on their level, quite literally in the case of the kudu, who are probably, in terms of height, their heads are probably exactly in line with mine. So they're almost exactly my height. So in looking at things from a kudu's perspective rather than from a vehicle's perspective, and that in turn is always thoroughly pleasant. Now she's actually stopped to feed, and I'm hoping that might allow us, let me just see, hold on. Hello, girlies. No, they're going to run off into some dense vegetation. Now, of course, a kudu really enjoys the thick vegetation of this area. So they are hiding away and they're actually moving around. I had to pop out there. Amolko, you wanted to know whether or not the drought has affected the antelope as badly. No, not as badly as things, particularly something like a buffalo. Because a buffalo is a bulk grazer, and it's 900 kilograms at its most. You know, that's that's well over a thousand pounds. That is a huge animal to feed and maintain. But unlike the elephants and the giraffe, it has to maintain itself on this. And this, this is good compared to what we've had in the past. Imagine 50 buffalo moving through this area trying to get food. Whereas with, if you're an antelope, they're a lot, lot smaller. And those kudu, what kudu, they've gone now. Let's try and look around from the termite mound. Those kudu are maybe 200, at the most maybe 300 kilograms. So you're looking at around under 600 pounds. It's a lot less animal to feed and they have the added advantage of feeding off the leaves of the trees and that in turn the trees have actually been the key to their success and the key to their survival in that the leaf the trees I was going to eat these leaves but now I have this feeling I'm going to get yes could get stabbed the trees have actually been the saviors of a great deal a great number of the herbivores because of course the root system can tap into water deep beneath the surface of the soil and access nutrients and store nutrients far better than the grasses can. Eggsy, would you like a leaf? No, They're completely tasteless, but the leaves of the buffalo, not completely tasteless, but the leaves of the buffalo thorn can be eaten as a sort of almost spinach-like equivalent. I'm trying to find you one that's nice. Oh dear, that was a, let me find you a young one. And quite bitter, but not bad tasting at all. There you go, Eggsy, you get a really tiny one. Sorry. Mm. So, you can imagine that the antelope have had a little bit more to feed on. And just by the way, if you would like your question answered on uh, perhaps the effects of the drought or anything similar, you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Sorry, I'm now slightly paranoid that I've got buffalo thorn in my teeth which is the, basically the equivalent of having spinach in my teeth which I'm hoping I don't have it seems as though the kudu have disappeared off <coughs> I can just see a retreating backside there we go so they haven't gone far they've just moved off to where they feel slightly more comfortable it's okay kudu and we're not going to follow them we're not going to stress them out any more than we have to here we go. Look at this. Now before 
we go back to that termite mound that I just climbed up, have a good, quick look at what used to be, judging by the shape of the plastron, a male speaks hinge tortoise. And tortoises are amazing the way that their skeletons, their ribs and so on are fused into these enormous plates. So essentially their backbone, I'm not touching the shell, you'll notice, uh, tortoise shells are actually, uh, we can, but I prefer not to. Uh, tortoise shells uh, can be relatively revolting in terms of the bacteria that they carry and they can also carry anthrax and we're not touching it at the moment these plates are all fused and you can see this would have been fused onto the backbone this is the pelvis this is the hip bone or part of the no part of the scapula sorry part of the scapula of this tortoise and this is the leg bone how cool is that we saw a tortoise this morning on our bushwalk a live one not a, a, a recently deceased one and this could have been killed by a number of things. Could have been killed by a bird. It could have been. It looks like it's actually been broken open by hyenas. Oh, there you go. Lots of tortoise shells to find. Right. Now we have a question that I don't know the answer to, which is not perhaps the best way to have prefaced that. We have a question about what the average height is of a termite mound. This is, this is probably an average sized termite mound, I would say. There's some monster termite mounds, absolutely monstrous termite mounds on cheetah plains that are truly huge, and I'm going to regret climbing all the way up here because now I'm going to have to get down safely. So this is probably maybe a little bit larger than average, and I'm talking because there's different types of species of termite and therefore different types of termite mound, but in terms of the ones that make these absolutely enormous turrets, this is, yeah, I would say this is of an average size. And how high would this be? Just under a story, I suppose. So around about two or so meters in height from the very tip top of it right to the base. And some of the, the, the termite mounds, I'm just gonna stay up here for a moment and just survey the area and try not to try not to break an ankle, which is basically what I'm contemplating right now. Uh, some of the termite mounds, for example, on Cheetah Plains are monstrous. They are absolutely huge. And that would have taken decades and decades. Don't get too much closer, eggs, because I'm I'm going to come running down. And I'm oh, it's actually not so bad. I was scared I was going to go careering into the camera, which would have been ow. Hilarious but less so for me and Eggsy. Buffalo thorn to the ankle. The one hooked thorn and the one straight thorn. So the zizifus that I just ate the leaves from. Now Aaron, you wanted to know, because I've said that termite mounds are warm. You want to know if they can be used as heaters in the bush. Yes, to an extent. There's a very, very famous South African story, and I have to try and remember the details of it now. There's a famous story. Eggsy, do you know this one? The little girl who got lost with her brother. Rachel Kudabir. S pardon? <laughs> Rachel Kudabir. Rachel Kudabir. Yeah. I think so. I think that's exactly yeah. what I'm thinking of, yeah. Rachel Kudabir. Kudabir. Rachel Ki? Rachel Ki de Beer. Rachel Ki de Beer. Rachel De Beer, Rachel Key De Beer, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. There's a very sad story about a little a little boy and a little girl. Correct me if I'm wrong, Eggsy, you know the story I'm thinking of. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don't remember the details, but she got lost with her little brother, and she got lost in a part of South Africa where, I don't know if it was the Free State or perhaps somewhere towards the Karoo, but basically somewhere where the temperatures drop below freezing each and every night. And she had her little brother with her, and she basically ensured his survival by finding a termite mound hollow and digging it out a little bit and then covering him with her body and she was found the next morning she didn't make it which was very sad and i think she was only she must have been only about 10 or so years old and she didn't she didn't survive but her little brother did as a result of the termite mound warmth um sort of it's emanating or the warmth emanating from the termite mound and the warmth of her so actually quite a tragic story but I'm glad that Eggsy knew which one I meant and Rachel De Beer thank you Rebecca's just said it in my ear as well and 
So yes, you can. We don't really use it during camping. And during camping, you'd be prepared. You wouldn't really want to use a termite mound for those purposes. On a cold winter's morning, if you climb to the top of a termite mound and you put your hand over the vent, you've got the warm air coming up through those vents. It's actually very nice. And if you watch, first thing on a cold winter's morning, you, see, you find all the hornbills sitting on the top of it, having a great time, picking off the odd termite and just utilizing their heat in the most fantastic of ways. So they are a warm body, um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend using them for camping. And of course now, camping at the moment, on days like today, it's probably not going to go much below, I would guess tonight, probably not much below 25 or so degrees centigrade. I want to go to the Balanites tree. We're going to go for a little stroll. We're going to start heading in that, that general direction. But we're just going to double check that there's not head in, not, not there. Blah, blah, blah. Too much talking. Um, there's nothing waiting to surprise us. And Herbie, of course, ever present ahead of us and checking to make sure the coast is clear. He's talking to the bastard. <laughs> I'm not sure who's talking. That's how good his impression is. I think he's talking to a black-bellied bustard, which is a type of bird, by the way, if you have just joined us, and it makes the most amazing whistling sound, and then a champagne cork pop at the end. Herbie, wait. Before you run away, Herbie, will you do the sound for them, please? The sound of the black-bellied bustard. Wait, hold on, I've got to get closer to you so it'll pick up on my microphone. I'm going to lift up my hat so you can do it into my microphone. That's amazing. The one's responding back to him. He's talking to him. Is that the That's the best impression I've ever heard of a black-bellied bustard. That is exactly what they sound like. And he's talking... He's responding to... Should we, try, should we see if we can see it? I'm sure that he's on the tour. He's going to come and attack you, Herbie. No. You're too good at the call. Isn't that amazing? I feel like creeping up. I don't think I've ever crept up on a black-bellied bustard before. But let's give it a go. Let's not walk, walk into something else. And there you go, Debbie. You wanted to know. If we do the actual black-bellied busted call, does it give the bird a fright? You raise a very important point in terms of ethics when calling birds. You've got to make sure that you don't... I wouldn't get a, a sort of a hi-fi system and some boombox-type speakers, or that was very old-fashioned of me, or any kind of speakers, and play it through and play it very loudly because that bird is going to become very intimidated because it now thinks that there is a rival that is possibly 10, 20 times its size, judging by the volume of its call. So you'll notice when we do imitate bird calls, we try and keep them at exactly the same volume as the bird that makes them. And then what you'll do is you'll get a response, just as the, in the same way that Herbie did, where he called it a normal black-bellied busted volume and the black-bellied busted responded, just as if to say, hey, Hey buddy, this is my spot, my spot, go away. So you've got to be careful, you've got to be careful when you do it with certain types of owls. Um, you, you could, for example, call in a tiny species of owl, but if you're playing around with different owl calls, O-W-L, because for some reason that's a word that doesn't come through clearly in the South African accent. If you start playing with the different owl calls, he's got it. with bird sounds. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Can you see? 
Christy and the eggs. There he is, he's on the left of that big tree. Yeah, I'll see him. Yeah. If we go this way a little bit, we'll see him. You got him. to the black-bellied bustard and the black-bellied bustard answered. <laughs> High five. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, now that we've found our beautiful bird and Herbie has called it out, we're going to head across to Byron for an update and we'll catch up with you shortly. So we've left those lines, everybody. They are still resting there, and we'd like to try to give everyone else a to them. Um, we did have some nice activity with those cubs suckling in that earlier, so that was lovely. We're going to see what else we can find. And I know um, Jamie was trying to show you the black-bellied bustard and that wonderful call that it does. Now, I wonder if I call I know Herbie was trying to do it let me see uh, I mean <laughs> let me see. This, is, this always gets tricky and I try not to laugh but um, goes by the way <laughs> something like that I can't do that first part very well <laughs> no it doesn't sound like that all right so we're going to be driving past this buffalo carcass that I think has been that we've been smelling and because the smell is getting a lot stronger now and stench and I'm not going to stop too long if we do see it I'll just point it out to you quickly Phew. the stench is terrible but you see the other thing is I think there's been there's been a number number of buffalo carcasses here but I think this is the one that is smelling so bad. All those flies around it. Now again, I think this possibly died from natural causes. I'm not sure if the lions got to this. Um, actually, I, I don't know. I don't know, but it hasn't been fed on. So I see some vulture feathers in that around. Doesn't appear as if they've been able to tear it open. Now usually the vulture that is needed for that is the big leopard faced vulture. They've got powerful beaks and they are able to, to tear open carcasses. And if they aren't around, usually the other vultures can't get in, so they can't feed on the meat. Unless obviously another predator has opened it up. And we haven't seen too many hyenas around um, because I'm surprised, you know, usually carcasses like that would attract hyenas. But I think, again, maybe the reason is because of all the lions around and the lion activity to cause the hyenas to possibly stay away a little bit longer than usual. Because we've had those Birmingham males around a lot. So lion, um, hyenas definitely don't like to tangle with big male lions. Now we're still in search of our woodland kingfisher. We heard one again earlier, but haven't seen one yet. Well, we kind of saw one. So, genre, we saw one this morning. Yeah, we definitely saw one this morning, but we need to get you a proper view of one in camera. So, <laughs> I saw on Twitter one of the viewers. I can't remember now which one it was, but they got a screenshot of uh, of the woodland flying through the frame and pointing to. I can't remember who it was actually, I apologize, but uh, but I did see that, I did see that. Yeah, um, Rebecca's feeling very jealous that she didn't really see it, but you know, you gotta, you gotta focus Rebecca in the FC, you gotta make sure you see what we see. <laughs> We're just on the northern boundary now, the Biffleshook cut line. 
Don't forget, everybody, we are completely live for those new viewers who are watching. Send us your questions on Twitter at hashtag Safari Live. Otherwise, email us with questions at wildearth.tv. And we'll answer your questions, and we love hearing from you and sending your comments through. Um, it is always, always great. It's lovely driving now. There's a beautiful cool breeze, which is great. Cooling things down a little bit for us. It was a hot afternoon. Uh, we just need to find some animals now. And then I'm looking forward to the night drive again later. We'll try and see what we can find. Hopefully a chameleon tonight. I know that we've been struggling with finding chameleons and I think, I actually don't know why, because we've had rain, so there's moisture around and it's starting to warm up quite a bit. So the, these reptiles should be more active. So hopefully we'll see some. Maybe another scorpion or two. James, Richard, you wanted me to give you my Woodland Kingfisher impersonation. Oh dear, James, why do you do this to me? Um, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, that was, how's that, John? Not bad. Woodland Kingfisher, everyone. <laughs> You see, I'm sure we'll hear them calling back shortly. A, <laughs> see if we get a flock flying over. <laughs> oh, it's been quiet again this afternoon, but you know, we spoke about this the other day, everybody, with um, um, with the weather that we've had recently. More areas have had a lot of rain, which is fantastic. I mean, it's wonderful for wildlife, and we are very, very fortunate to have all this rain. But what's happened now is now there's grass and it looks like a dronga up at the top of a tree. It was just having a quick look. So what's happened now is a lot of other areas are growing green grass and uh, and the leaves are, are, are out. So the vegetation's lush, not just here, but all over. So the animals are able to spread out a lot more. There's also a lot more water down in the rivers and uh, animals tend to move down towards rivers quite regularly, especially elephants and buffalo. Um, so I think that it's possibly caused the general population of animals that we had on Juma three weeks ago just to spread out a little bit more which is not a bad thing it's a wonderful thing um, but I have noticed that we've had a slight little not a, not a dip but I've noticed a few fewer animals around you see something there Jandre I wonder if that's not uh, from last night yes, perhaps I think so. I don't see any fresh tracks here now. Some elephant tracks around. James, you wanted to know, is there any update on the Shaluva Tingan incident? So um, I know Brent was following up on that quite a bit. Um, and, and it's an interesting situation. I don't know, and I, I'm sure, I know Brent spoke about it a bit this morning. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Oh, let's see if we can. I wonder if we can find this guy. I quickly want to show you, everyone. Sorry, James, I'll get back to your question now. I want to show you something. Uh, Jandre, how's that? Can you get that? All right, let me show you a very interesting track. Let me just get off there. Oh. Can you see this, everybody? Have a look here. Beautiful line in the sand. 
And now I wonder if any of you can guess what this is. I'll give you a few minutes, but um, there's actually a beautiful little track on this side, and there's one over here, over there, and this drag mark in the middle. There's another track, and another one, and I can see some sharp claws in these tracks too. Uh, I wonder would be wonderful if we could find this animal. I'm just going to look here quickly. Oh no, it's walked all the way down the road. So let's see, let's follow it a little bit, who knows? Maybe we find it. I'll give you another clue. We were speaking about reptiles earlier. This is a reptile. So, any guesses yet? Let me just plug in here. All right, let's have a look. Let's just see, maybe, who knows, if you find it, that could be really interesting. See, it's walked all along the road here. And this looks fairly fresh. Doesn't look like many vehicle tracks have driven over it. Uh, uh, no, it's gone now. Lindsay, you think that this is a drag mark from a lizard. I'm just having a look to see if I see any more tracks here. Looks like it turned off the road back there. Uh, and it is indeed a drag mark of sorts from a lizard. What it is, it is a big monitor lizard that has walked along the road. So we've got two species of monitor lizards big rock monitor um, or the water monitor. I'm assuming that this is a rock monitor. Very large lizard and also we're not very close to any water up here at the moment where we are. So I think this would have been a rock monitor and what it's done is it's walked and then what happens is the, dra the tail just gets dragged behind it and that's that little drag mark that you can see in the center of the track. So that's what that was, a rock monitor. I see the sharp claws, they've got very sharp claws as I pointed out to you. It's a bit tricky to see in that sand, but you can see the claws as they're walking, digging into the sand. Definitely getting active, so that's good. Good news for us. James, getting back to your question about the leopards now, I don't really know why that male attacked the female. Um, you know, the, I, I think possibly there, there are a number of number of reasons, and you know, it's, fortunately, I've had a lot of experience.
welcome back to the Sunset Safari and a very good afternoon and we do apologize for the minor moment of the gremlins attacking. At first Byron lost his signal and as you may or may not have noticed, I'm not sure how observant some of you are feeling, last time you saw me I was walking, I'm no longer walking, I'm driving in a vehicle and Brent has returned to camp but I am in Rusty which is fantastic news, Herbie and Zander are doing a long march home and Viam and myself are now in Rusty which is great because it means I get to experience the new no door policy. I keep reaching to shut it, but it's so much fun. <laughs> I haven't driven without a door in ages. Oh, it really is quite a pleasure. We took the door off, of course, for those of you who are perhaps have missed out on a few live safaris. We took the door off because it's just easier for Brent to be able to turn around and talk to you, particularly over his right shoulder, um, because he is so tall. I'm looking to see if any of these have babies. Uh, because he is so tall, it's just easier for him to turn without the door. And just bear with me one second, please. I'm absolutely parched and I haven't quite had a moment to have a drink, so just bear with me one moment. Mm. It was quite a warm afternoon for a rapid stroll through the vegetation. Any babies? I don't see any babies. In fact, I'm not sure I see any females. Oh, that's a female. That was a female. I thought she looked a bit round for a male. Hmm. So we've had the first woodlands, but we have not yet had the first impala baby. And that's what we're going to be searching for this, for the rest of the afternoon, I think. I haven't, I haven't quite figured out what my plan is just yet, since I've only just landed in the vehicle. I'll figure, we'll figure it out as we go along. Can I have some of this water, Vian? Yeah. Thank you. That one is... Yes, that was my fresh water. Is that your fresh water? You can it. Oh, thank you. Yes, Much appreciated. Sorry, everybody. I really just need a quick drink and then I will be up and running. Mm. Phew. Thanks, Viam. Much appreciated. All right. That's better now we can hit the road. I wish you could have seen me when I first got into the vehicle. I already feel far too low. Usually I sit on about two and a half odd blankets piled up so that I can see and I sit with the seat actually I must just do that as well quickly. I sit with the seat right forward so that I don't end up struggling to reach the clutch. But when I got in now, looking through my monitor, that was about as much of my head as you could see. <laughs> with me sitting in Brent's normal seat. So you get an idea as to just why he needed to have the door removed. Okay, while I trundle on and switch from walk mode to drive mode, let's go back to Byron, who's managed to find some good signal. Sam, we've been uh, struggling with some... Dearie B, well it seems as though Byron has lost signal, in which case you are still with me. That's all right, we'll continue on and we'll stop and see whether or not this hornbill has perhaps got a nest somewhere here. Excuse me, have you got a nest? Or are you simply surveying the area? A yellow-billed hornbill. Enjoying a brief break and a brief, brief, there, brief. Sorry, still trying to, to marshal my thoughts. A brief rest and a moment to sunbathe. I love Hornball. There is, there is something innately comical about them and I don't think I'm the only person that feels that way. There's just something highly entertaining about them and they have an almost slightly manic expression in their eyes whenever you get to see them up close. I actually have a suspicion, well, I was going to say they're quite bright birds, but actually maybe not, because they do sit for hours on end and peck at windows and mirrors on cars, trying to attack what they think is a rival hornbill, but is in fact just their reflection. This is a male, just judging by the broadness of his bill, the, the, the sort of the cask, it's not quite a cask on the yellow-billed hornbill, but that prominent ridge that runs along 
the top of the bull. It's slightly more pronounced in the male hornbills than the females. I can hear a black-bellied bustard. Where do I hear the black-bellied bustard? We'll continue our search on the vehicle. <laughs> Viam, Herbert just did the best black-bellied bustard impression. It was better than Brian's, and Brian's is good. Herbert's, Herbert's was spot on. You wanted to know on the subject of birds whether or not I have ever seen a shoebill. And I would love to show everybody what a shoebill looks like, but unfortunately I'm in Brent's vehicle and, and he hasn't got a bird book with him, I don't think. He does have a rather tattered butterfly book. Um, Claire, I have never seen a shoebill and I'm dying to see a shoebill. I have seen them on documentaries and I have seen them on um, people's pictures, which sounds ridiculous, but I've never in real life seen a shoebill. And it's one of my dream birds to check off my list. Now, a shoebill is a sort of almost stork-like bird, just in terms of its, its height and the way that it stands and it wades through water. And it's got this massive, hence the name, this massive bull, enormously heavy looking thing. And th I'm sure some of you have seen them on documentaries. I do wish I could show you a picture, but unfortunately I can't. But they are truly fascinating creatures. I did once in the height of my exam stress, and it was around the time. Which documentary was it? It was not the. It was one of the BBC nature documentaries, and I think it was um, Africa. And they did a whole sequence on a shoebill, and I was watching that to de-stress. And it was my third year at university, so it was my final year. So the stress levels were relatively high, and I had a stress-induced dream of a shoebill surrounded by psychedelic sort of 80s swirls in neon colours, and it was dispensed the kind of life advice that you would find on a Hallmark card. And that, I think, to date, has been one of my strangest ever dreams. And I think it gave some insight into the madness that was happening in my head at the time. It was totally bizarre. And they've got this way of turning their heads and sort of looking at you from the side, like all birds do, I suppose, but it's kind of sinister with a shoebill. So the closest I have come to seeing a shoebill was a psychedelic version in a stress-induced dream during my exam period. Sorry, I was trying to stop for the dwarf mongoose, but they've all run away. They've all vanished. But one day I shall see a shoebill. I'm dreaming of that day. to Easy Peasy. I hope you are having a marvellous sunset safari. Easy Peasy, you want to know, apart from vultures, are there any other meat-eating birds in the Greater Kruger National Park area? Easy Peasy, yes, lots and lots and lots of them. So we've got many different species of eagle, some of which, just like the vultures, will scavenge off carcasses. So things like tawny eagles and an, a short-tailed snake eagle, which is known as a battalier, uh, they will scavenge off carcasses. Um, in fact, almost all eagles will, if given the opportunity. So we've got eagles, we've got a variety of hawks and goshawks, and sorry, I'm trying to sneak up on these beautiful kudu. Let's just stop for a second. So in short, easy peasy, yes, and I will give you a slightly longer answer after we've just touched upon these beautiful male kudu. We saw some females earlier on in the walk. Didn't see any males with them. But now we've got these beautiful gentlemen with their long spiraling horns. Let's see if we can't get a slightly better view if they'll let us. The males, oh, I was hoping we'd, come on. Oh, we were just on a downhill. Come on, here we go. Or not. That was a little bit of a letdown. Come on, Rusty. Trying to sneak forward without turning on our engine. Don't go, mister. Okay, I think... I think this is actually going to be 
Anyway, if we go any further, he's going to run away. So we'll settle for this view for now. And just watch him as he goes about his afternoon lunch. Ah, there he goes. Now we can go forward and get a slightly better view. Easy peasy, don't despair. I am coming back to your question. But there's a distraction here in the form of one of the most exquisitely dignified antelope that we get. And off they march. Stopping to have a jolly good sniff at a burnt... Oh, hi. Just goes to show, <laughs> whenever you stop and look at kudu, the more kudu you will find. There's usually several of them hidden away. And there's a young male, and there's a two more. Have you found some more? Oh, look at that. I don't even know where Viam's looking at this point. Hidden in the veg... Oh, there we go, I do see one. So uh, there's actually quite a few kudu that we've stumbled upon. This is a relatively young male. Still hasn't quite reached its fully his fully grown point. His horns haven't... Uh, they've just managed the second twirl. So he's just got to two. A fully grown or sort of mature adult kudu bull will have at least two and a half twirls to the horns. Isn't that the crazy to think that that is bone? Solid bone? Doesn't it amaze you that it's able to grow in those fantastic shapes? And each and every single kudu does it. It's not like it's some kind of deformity. It's just the way their bone grows. And you have to wonder at the biology and the genetics that have laid down that sort of a pattern. And there we go. Definitely one of the most stunning antelope. They are, however, also quite shy, and most of them are hidden behind some relatively dense vegetation. Oh, it seems as though, <laughs> fingers crossed, Byron has once again managed to find some signal. Let's head across and see where he is. Oh, we do seem to have signal again, everyone. It's dropping on us a lot, though. But we had Biffles Hook Dam at the moment. And we've got these beautiful blacksmith lapwings walking about. That little one over there. Really, really beautiful birds. Now, I'd want to try and get back to that question that we heard, had earlier. And James was asking... Um, I think it was James asking about um, the leopards and what actually happened, an update on that situation. So, as I was explaining, I, I've been fortunate, I've seen a lot of leopard behavior and leopard activity in the past. Um, all that I can think, or the theory that I think, was maybe this male leopard moving into a territory he's not familiar with, Tingana, maybe moving a little bit further north, out of his territory, a little bit nervous, a little bit a agitated, and possibly a bit more aggressive, because there are other male leopards that move around through that territory. That may have caused him to be a little bit more aggressive than usual. Um, I have seen male leopards attacking female leopards before, um, possibly for, for food, but if not, um, the other reason is maybe he thought that this female is, is pregnant and, um, and has a cub that doesn't belong to him. That could also have sparked something, a bit of aggression. Um, these animals, it, it, it depends. I mean, who knows the exact reason? I, I, I'm not sure. But I think maybe a combination of all of those factors may have made him a little bit aggressive. I've seen a male leopard run up into a tree before and try and chase out a young cub or get to a young cub that, that wasn't his and the female ran up to try and help help the youngster and that male in turn and attacked the female and killed the female so it can happen um and maybe she was trying to protect something maybe who knows who knows but uh, maybe she wasn't as submissive as she should have been so that's perhaps what caused uh, caused that male to attack the female he did kill her she's definitely dead dead as we heard this morning he was around the carcass the male leopard was still around the carcass so it's sad but again you know it's it's not always an easy thing to see or hear about but nature's way of finding a balance or keeping a balance and we may not understand it but that is nature's way and it, it's not always easy and that's the thing about safari live it's raw it's uncut and that's what we see and what we hear and what we view is completely natural these animals are in their natural environment 
and we don't have all the answers it's very difficult at times but it's interesting behavior we can give you our theories we can try and work things out but who knows it's uh, and that's why i love what i do is because it's there's never a guarantee some beautiful swallows flying around i wonder if we can get them everyone swallows are always very difficult to for, uh, fill um, these are red-breasted swallows that are flying about at the moment. Uh, sure. <laughs> well done, jean -Ray. It's so difficult to see. There's another... And there's a bird of prey above us, jean -Ray. Maybe we can try to get that. It might be a bit easier. Just over there, it's soaring. There we go. Now, that is the African harrier hawk, everyone. Oh, I wonder, it would be wonderful it came down to one of these trees and maybe, oh, it just dropped, just dropped through there, yeah, so, that's the African Harrier Hawk, used to be known as the Gymnogene, and we did see one earlier, unfortunately we couldn't show you it when we lost our signal, and one was being mobbed by a number of birds, I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't get mobbed soon too. Yeah, a lot of birds flying in there now, so could possibly mob it and chase it away. And the reason they mob it is because it does raid nests and look for chicks. So it is a bird of prey that those birds will not be happy about. And they'll try and chase it away. Um, so it seems like our signal's been pretty stable here, which is good. Maybe we should just not move. We should just stay here and see what comes down to the water. Now, what have we got over there? Uh, wood, no, sorry, a double banded plover. That's a little double banded plover, or three banded, sorry, three banded plover. Little three banded plover bobbing around looking for, for some food. Little insects in the water, in the mud. And it's a beautiful little. I love seeing these little th double banded plovers. Oh, three banded. Why do I keep saying double banded? The three banded plover. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. Beautiful, beautiful little plover. And they do occur through most parts of, of South Africa. It's nice to see them bobbing around. There was a wood sandpiper around here too. I'm trying to look for it. But some interesting birds around here. It's a beautiful sun um, or light at the moment o over the dam. Isn't that wonderful? You can see how green and lush the bush is looking at the moment. And it's a bright green. It's this deep, bright green. Um, which is just incredible. It's actually hard to explain and I don't think you really get the full effect on camera. Um, but it is a wonderful, wonderful color. Lovely time of year. <laughs> a question from Cupcake Sugar Pie. <laughs> Um, I, I do like a Twitter handle, it's quite funny. Let me show you a picture of the three banded plover just over there. Oh, sorry. And you can see the two clear bands one, two. I'm not sure why it's a three banded plover. <laughs> it clearly says double black band, but yet they call it the three banded plover. So may, maybe. Uh, maybe because of that white band in between the two black bands so possibly that's why they call it the three banded two black and one white um, perhaps I don't know uh, I always struggle with some of these bird names where the names come from and there it is again it's a beautiful little bird often find them around water holes It's very, very peaceful. I'm trying to listen out for some more birds and specifically for that woodland kingfisher. Um, and while I do that, I'm also scanning. 
Day Coelho would like to know if there's a crocodile in this water and I haven't seen one and I, I don't know of a time where they have ever seen a crocodile in here I'm not sure Chandra if you know no no crocodiles have been spotted in a hippos yes but no crocodiles I, I think perhaps because this water fluctuates quite a bit maybe it's not ideal conditions for crocodiles they prefer staying in rivers and that maybe more permanent water um, now there is some other there are some other interesting birds I'd like to point out just off to the to the left um, on the on the bank um, a little bit further left Chandra that uh, second pan actually actually just through there on that island that you can see and you should see them bottom right hand screen now there we go very very well camouflaged and those are water thick knees little water thickenies very very well camouflaged and they are generally nocturnal but they've been giving me a little whistle I've got a high pitch whistle <laughs> something like that <laughs> and these little little um, um, thick knees are um, are just perched around the water let me see if I can One sixteen, one sixteen. Let me just show you quickly. Um, let me just quickly show you what this little bird looks like. You can see them there, but have a look now. We get two species: the water and the spotted thickney, just over here. Um, so that's the water thickney on the left and the spotted thickney on the right. They look very, very similar. Um, Water thickney generally has a lighter coloration underneath and a bit of a black stripe on the wing, but um, but also they are found close to water. So and they are mainly nocturnal. You see those big eyes, so um, so they are mainly nocturnal. But you do hear them and see them during the day. Now, easy peasy, you asked, out of the birds in. Um, in the Kruger which immigrate the furthest now I think you mean migrate um, they don't immigrate because they do return um, so they don't leave us for good but um, the migratory species then there are a number of them but ones that migrate the furthest um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, these Warburg's eagles do fly really far, and they fly, I think, into East, uh, Eastern Europe a little bit. But I think well, this little one, let me show you, um, and you'd be so surprised. Uh, let me just find it first, and then I'll show it to you. Uh, it's a little shrike, which... Uh, which is very very interesting two two four and it's incredible how far some of these little red-backed shrikes now have a look I've got the picture right here so this one in the top left hand corner the red-backed shrike now they migrate and look at that and that one's got some speckles on the under and the belly but generally the adults look like this one at the bottom over here that's a red back shrike now um, they depart usually around March April um, and then they when they do migrate north and then they come back uh, mid to late November now I'm trying to see now I'm just gonna get my app everybody so um, because these apps are wonderful they've got a lot more information in them so what I want to do is just quickly read up on on where they migrate and uh, let's just quickly let me just look very quickly for you um, so some of them how's this so they, they they breed throughout most of Europe Western Asia and north all the way to Scandinavia so that's incredible how these little red back shrikes migrate all the way up to Scandinavia and then uh, and then in the winters uh, or the European winters the summers they come back down um, to to southern Africa um, you know so we do get them around here that's probably the one that I know of that migrates or one of them that migrate the furthest one that I can think think of offhand 
Anyway, we're going to try and move around a little bit more. Let's see if our signal works. While we do that, let's head back to Jamie and see what she's up to on, on the vehicle this time. <laughs> I do hope that uh, I do hope that Byron does manage to move and that he doesn't lose his signal. In the meantime, I've been coming to grips with the reality that is not having your right door. Uh, but just because I haven't done it in a while, I keep doing this. I'm going to go and lean and just <laughs> half topple out of the car every single, and I want to go and rest my arm like I always do, and it's just sort of dangles pathetically and then I lean out to look for tracks and I have a momentary sense of almost vertigo like feeling like I'm going to go tumbling out of the vehicle and it's just because I'm out of practice the worst part was a little bit earlier when I completely forgot I didn't have a door and there was a tree in the road and I squeezed past it and usually the door of course would protect me but of course I didn't have a door which meant that the tree was then very much in my lap I wasn't terribly impressed with that. All in all though, it does give us a great freedom of motion. It also makes tracking, whoops, it makes tracking a great deal easier for me at least, especially because I'm short one blanket and am just short. I can't see over the bonnet, but I can. I no longer have to veer right off the side of the road. I can just glance over the side. It's quite lovely. Other than that, not much has changed. There were some elephants, as you may have gathered from the fact that there was a tree in the road. Elephants have been feeding in that area and it looks as though their tracks started to move towards Treehouse Dam. So hopefully we get there in a time to catch them drinking. It didn't look that fresh to me though. But we'll go and have a look at Treehouse Waterhole and see what's come down and decided to drink there. It is for some reason though, quite an unpopular waterhole in terms of seeing large herds of animals gather there. The buffalo sometimes move through, but we don't often see the elephants drinking there. The wild dogs occasionally stop off. But other than that, we don't really see Impala or Nyala or anything else coming to drink at this particular waterhole. I don't know what it is. Perhaps it's just not quite full enough for them. So they have to, they feel a little bit too exposed when walking down towards that water. But let us nevertheless go and see what's gathered at Treehouse Dam. And a very warm welcome to Stephen, who has only recently discovered this site and these live safaris. And Stephen says that he loves it. Well, Stephen, I'm thrilled to hear that, and I'm so glad that you did send through your comment. We always love hearing from new viewers, and we do enjoy welcoming them to their newest addiction. And it does become a little bit of an addiction. I think a lot of our viewers will tell you. Uh, some of the viewers have been watching for many, many, many years. So it can become, it becomes a huge part of our, you become a part of our lives in a big way as well, Stephen. If you do stick around, when you stick around and join us for more safaris, we'll get to know your name, we start to learn your favorite animals. It's a wonderful way of uh, connecting. And speaking of uh, connecting, since my elephants um, haven't arrived at Treehouse Dam, from what I can see, seems as though Byron has managed to connect with some. I have indeed my favorites. I've managed to find some elephant and isn't this wonderful? Look how they caked in mud. They've obviously been bathing somewhere, splashing mud on themselves during the course of the day to cool down. This is a young elephant. Oh, come say hello. Looks like a young male. That's wonderful. I love, love, love seeing elephant. There are a few around, but I think they've gone down in towards the uh, the drainage line just off to our right. There's one or two youngsters around here still, but you can, if you listen carefully, you can probably hear them feeding. Why don't we? Why don't we chance our signal a little bit? I, 
Well, let's just wait. I don't want to move just yet in case we lose signal. The signal's been terrible this afternoon. I do apologize. As long as you are getting to see these elephants, that's the most important thing. <laughs> See how it's waving its ears, trying to cool itself down. And they fan their ears like that because of the network of veins that run through the back of the ears. We might be able to see if it opens its ears again. Now you can see some of the veins through there. Now, now oh, look at that, you can see that clearly. So what happens is, there's a lot of blood which moves through those ears, and those ears are very, very thin. And what happens while they are flapping their ears, that cools the blood down slightly. Not by much, but a little bit. And it takes about seven to eight minutes for the blood to circulate through the body from the ears. And that then helps regulate the temperature. It does cool them down a little bit. As I said again, it's not by a lot, but it will help cool them down and cool the blood down a little bit. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> um, are we going to try and move a little bit now? Eggsy on safari, you would like to know, was that a white tick that we saw on the back of the ear? I didn't. I unfortunately didn't have a good look at it. Possibly, I mean, they can get ticks, so it was possibly a tick. Maybe it was a scratch or something, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't see very clearly, but it is possible that it could be a tick, but it'll probably fall off at some point. Let me try and move forward for us, everybody. Let's see. No signal issues. <laughs> I'm sure the back is holding. Come on. I'll just creep very, very slowly. Uh, where the rest of them are? Uh, they're moving off. This one's kind of hiding in the trees now. There's another one off to our right. Hang on a second, we might get a nice view from here, Jandre. See that one now. So there, there's one on either side of us now, but this one's still, I think. Oh, sorry, Jandre. Um, oh. yeah, definitely a young male. could go through that, that dung now um, and see how, just how inefficient their digestive system is. We've spoken about it many times before. They don't absorb a lot of food from the, uh, um, or a lot of nutrients rather, from the food that they feed on. And that dung will be very, very coarse and full of broken branches and leaves and sticks. Bree, all the way from Denver. Good afternoon, almost almost evening, early evening. Bree, you wanted to know what is my favourite characteristic of the elephant. Bree, I, I wonder. I think, you know, I, I do believe, I do believe that elephants are one of the most intelligent animals out here, and um, and I think, um, you know, we were speaking about it earlier, uh, genre, and I was speaking about. We had a question about the mourning and if animals do mourn other, um, you know, species or their s same species if someone dies because of the, what's going on with the lions. And you were know, speaking about the elephant, and I, I think they do mourn to an extent. I don't think it's mourning that we recognize mourning to be, but they do definitely um, recognize the death of an animal in their in their herd and often if they go past old elephant carcasses they will stop to smell um, uh, who knows exactly there I know there are a lot of theories in that I don't know if I believe all of them but but um, they definitely do recognize that and they do recognize areas incredible memories but I think um, I th I think that that is it for me is the ability for them to recognize places and smells and each other and people and vehicles 
Um, I do think uh, with that intelligence, it's, um, it's definitely the characteristic that I love the most is just them being so intelligent. And also, I suppose, you know, just with them being so gentle, but also so powerful, being able to push over massive trees and yet pick up a tiny little leaf with the tip of their trunk. It's incredible to see that contrast. Can you hear that? Oh, there's branches breaking, low frequency um, vocalizations communicating with each other. They've stopped now. Oh, I'm going to sit here a little bit longer with these elephant, but before or while I do that, Jamie's got a bird she wants to show you quickly. We just had to uh, pull you across from Byron and those elephants just to show you. There we go, he's going to start to call. The bird that Herbie was imitating a little bit earlier on. The black-bellied bustard. Come on, call for us. Give your proper call. That amazing whistle accompanied by a champagne cork pop at the end. I love the way they walk. If you watch them, it looks as though their head is pulling them forward. Like there's some kind of... <laughs> ground of some kind of force that that allows them to pull themselves along by their heads and so the head stretches forward and then is backwards again fascinating to watch the way that they move come on bastard give us a call <laughs> and Paul you say you literally could not tell the difference between the two you're not the only one uh, uh, when Herbie was busy calling, I actually thought it was just a black-bellied bustard. I didn't realize that Herbie was in the process of ha having a conversation with one of them. They are, they are indistinguishable. It is incredible. The only part is maybe that champagne pop at the end. But even then, it was a faultless performance from Herbie. Absolutely faultless. I was amazed. I think our black-bellied bustard, unfortunately, has disappeared. Yeah. Oh well. I'm glad we got to see one and to put one on camera properly because of course it's a little bit tricky on bushwalk. As they, that one was moving away slowly but surely. No, it's vanished, unfortunately. It has disappeared. That's okay. We'll continue along on this beautiful, beautiful evening. Really stunning summer's evening and go and see what else we can find. I'm planning a quick trip to my crested barbet nest on Twin Dams just to see if anybody's home and whether or not perhaps they've laid eggs. We won't be able to see right the way in, but it'll be nice to stop up and check on them, see how they're doing. Found, the, found this nest a couple of weeks ago with the barbet cleaning it out, pulling out chips of wood. And if my calcul it depends on when he laid eggs, not he laid eggs. <laughs> he didn't do any egg laying when his his mate <laughs> laid her eggs. Um, depends on when she laid her eggs, but it, that was about it was before I went on leave, and quite a while before I went on leave. So it must have been about a month ago, which means that we could well start to see little chicks poking their heads out if they're feeling brave. They would have hatched around about now. Let us go and investigate. I'm also keeping an eye out for the Queen of Juma, just to see whether or not she's crossed back from our southern boundary and returned to us once again, because I'm not 100% sure whether or not she crossed with her cubs. Uh-oh. Roadblock. I'm going to take this person's route around the tree. After my last attempt at squeezing through the trees, I'm not going to repeat it. That's, that's not elephants. That's a tree that's been dead for a long time, probably rotted and blew over in a storm. That tree was not pushed over by any kind of elephant. There's no way it would bother, any elephant would bother with something without leaves. 
Anything in the big balanites? Nope. One day I'll see a leopard in that tree. Okay. Here's our barbet nest. Oh no! Oh dear! Oh no, that's okay. The hole is there. Oh, it's very dark. I'm trying to add a little bit of. L mm. I can't add any light because the spotlight is con currently under 10 kilograms of cables and trapped underneath all of Brent's stuff. Here we go. So that's the hole that the crested barbet was excavating. I can hear it. The barbet's calling. And that could well be him. Where is he? I can also hear a red chested cuckoo. And the crested barbet trilling happily away. No sign of little chicks are poking their heads up. But the crested barbers is here somewhere. And I can almost guarantee it's the pair that were responsible for this nest. Let's see if we can find him quickly. I hear him. Sorry, there goes a. S uh, there it went. <laughs> well done, Viam. There was a slender mongoose that went dashing off, but there's our crested barbet. Let's give it. Give us a troll. You were making such a lovely sound earlier. Aren't they beautiful? With their red and their yellow and. All those bright colours. And of course, in case you were wondering why it was called a crested barbet, well, now you know. That ridiculous... Sorry, it is a little bit... Oh, sorry, that was my fault. Foot off the brake. With that ridiculous crest of feathers. Having a thorough preening session. I actually think it might even have gone down and had a bath or a quick rinse in the nearby pan. Puffed right up, spreading that preen oil, and at the same time picking off ticks, particularly pepper ticks for birds, the larval form or the larval stage of the various tick species that we get. It's a really nice opportunity to just sit and listen to the sounds of the bush. Lovely. I just saw the second crested barbet fly past me, but I don't know where it's gone. I don't no, I thought it was going towards the nest. Oh, and we've lost our original crested barbet. All right. I suppose that's the sig signal to move on. Find out what these waterbuck are all staring at. We need a better collective noun for waterbuck than just a herd. A circle of waterbuck. A circle of waterbuck. <laughs> <laughs> a circle of waterbuck is a much better collective noun for a group of waterbuck. A stink of waterbuck, or is that just rude? It works. It works. They are pretty smelly. Or a fluff. A fluff of waterbuck. I like that too. A fluff of waterbuck. I don't know if any of you have any suggestions as to a slightly more appropriate, a slightly more fun collective noun. I don't see why giraffe should get journey and zebra should get dazzle and a herd of waterbuck is just a herd. 
it's a little boring, don't you think? In fact, I think we should come up with collective nouns for all of the ones that we don't have. Oh, what? Sorry? Rebecca says that Jerry says it's a something of waterbuck. <laughs> Sorry. Jerry says it's a sip of water buck, as in, please can I have a sip of your water buck? <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> a sip of water buck. I don't know, I think a fluff. What is wrong, little water buck? What's got them so panicked? Not panicked, so one's a bit panicky. The others are all staring off in one direction. I wonder if a pack of wild dogs haven't just come through and we haven't seen them. Let's just go forward a little bit. There is something that they're keen on seeing, watching. That one little water buck. Its behavior suggests there was a predator at some point. They've all stopped and frozen. It could just be that they've seen another water buck, to be honest. Um, occasionally, antelope do do that. They're not quite, they're not always the brightest, n not brightest, but they're not always the sharpest. They don't have, always have the sharpest vision. But they are very alert. Okay. Everybody seems to be relaxing, so perhaps just a false alarm. I think a fluff wins for me. I quite like a fluff of waterbuck. I'm not sure if they do actually have an official collective noun. I don't, if, if they do, I don't know what it is. I'll be quite disappointed if there is actually an official one and it isn't as good as ours. A curious, a curious one is on the same page as VM. Curious one says a ring of waterbuck. Well done, curious one, agreed. That works pretty well as well, considering their dominant patterning. A splash of waterbuck. Jackie J, you say a splash of waterbuck? It's hard to choose. I think I might have opened a can of worms here. How on earth are we going to decide which is the best name for a group of waterbuck? Why are you staring in the opposite direction now? What am I missing? Nothing. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything. See, this is where a door would hinder me. But I don't have to worry now without the door. Just think, the opportunities are... Uh, look at this, I can turn like this and be thoroughly comfortable. The opportunities are positively boundless in terms of the different um, collective nouns that we could come up with. Not just for waterbuck, we need some for kudu as well, since it is just a herd of kudu, and perhaps some for nyala. And the mongoose. And Slender Mongoose. Uh, I haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't really ever found the opportunity to use a collective down for a Slender Mongoose. Uh, they do, they, you're right, I, I can't argue. That would be very specious of me if I were only to, to give collective nouns to the various bovids and ruminants of this area. What about a, a catwalk of Kudu? Because they do look a little bit like the sort of the supermodels of the antelope world. Yes, no, maybe not. What could a slender mongoose be? Because, I mean, it is a business of mongoose, but somehow that doesn't quite fit with a group of slender mongoose. A surprise of slender mongoose would be perhaps an appropriate one, since they are solitary. So a collective noun might be a surprise. <laughs> Look at that beautiful sky. Mm. Vividly pink this evening. Since it is such a gorgeous evening, I think it deserves a second perspective. Let's go and have a look at the view that Byron has to offer. <laughs> look at this beautiful silhouette that we've got at the moment. There's a vulture sitting up on, two vultures sitting on this dead tree. But just watch 
what happens when we zoom out a little bit. Look at that wonderful sunset, that color in the sky is fantastic. And these two vultures silhouetted against that light, this beautiful pink, pinky, orange, purple, wonderful colors. That is really, really beautiful. Wow. No, I mean, usually if I had guests on safari, I'd say to them, okay, we'll stop for a short little break, stretch your legs and perhaps get some refreshments. So wherever you are watching around the world, if you are having a refreshment, I hope you're enjoying this sunset with us, the sundowners as we usually call them. And, um, and I know I have a few favorite sundowners especially when out in the bush and it's nice to sit here just listen what's going on around you enjoying the bird sounds and uh, and then watching the sun go down very very peaceful I think it's good for the soul I always say that but I do believe that it is good for the soul and people do not need to try and appreciate nature a lot as much as possible and get out more and try and get away from the hustle and bustle of the city I know it's not always easy with jobs and so on but when you can try and just appreciate uh, what is out there I know even for us even though we're out here I, I do try and remind guests and that especially when they're with us just how fortunate and privileged we are to be able to view this and even friends of mine that work in the bush you know on a daily basis it is so nice to be able to do this um, and bring a bit of Africa to your homes around the world so I hope you enjoy it as much as we do because it is it's a special place and it's a, it's a special feeling Darian, a new viewer. Welcome, Darian. Great to have you with us. And good morning, or from us, a good evening. It's almost evening. And you wanted to know where exactly are we? So we are situated right up in the northeastern part of South Africa. Now, we're in an area known as the Greater Kruger National Park. Um, and we are situated in a small area known as the Sabi Sands. And we are on Juma Game Reserve. Now, as I said, that's basically, I've just gone from the Greater Kruger and, um, and brought it in a little bit to the Sabi Sands and then to Juma in that area. There are no fences between us and the Kruger National Park, which is the largest national park in South Africa. It's all open, so the animals can move freely. We do still have our boundaries, which we as guides and, and vehicles and different lodges um, stick to, but the animals can move around freely, which is wonderful. Now, this area is about 3.2 million hectares, almost 7 million acres of land open land free roaming for these animals which is incredible now um, you wanted to know how many guides we have so on safari live we've got uh, we've got five guides I believe is it the five guides six six including Steph yeah so so um, it is Brent and Jamie and then James and Taylor and Stefan and Steph so James Taylor and Steph are away at the moment Steph will be back tomorrow and then I fill in for those guides when they need a rest and uh, they need some time and some time off and I occasionally come in and help out for a week or two or sometimes three weeks which is nice wonderful to get into the bush but I do do a lot of guiding all over Africa, which is great. So I get to see a lot of different places. Oh, sharp talons on that, on that vulture, incredible. Very ominous looking, the vultures sitting crouched with their heads low down in the tree. Haley, you want to know how long can a vulture live for? Haley, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and hazard a guess. Let me see if I can find anything that's a little bit more accurate on my bird app. Um, because I, I think it's around 
10 to 10 to 15 years perhaps but I'm not sure while I try and find out Jamie's watching that beautiful sunset from another angle let's head to her and see what the view is like A beautiful sunset accompanied by some really stunning sound effects. Oh, and now you do it, you two. They stopped earlier, so we were going to look at the sunset until they started again, but we've got male impala sparring as well. <laughs> that was a funny face. Now, of course, our impala are a little bit confused at the moment, or at least the boys are. Um, they are going into what's known as a false rut because all of the pregnancy hormones that are floating about have confused them and they think that the females are coming into estrus. They could not of course be further from the truth but it's led to dramatic... Oh, the baboon's calling as well. It's led to some dramatic fight scenes. This is not as serious as it would be during the normal rut. I can hear baboons as well which has distracted me. And so can they, which has distracted them. So it's not as serious as an impala fight can get. But these are two fully grown rams. And they are... Oh, well, I suppose it helps in a way. You don't get rusty when the time comes to really fight. And that yawning face that he's making is a sort of a precursor to the sound that they make. That roaring, grunting sound. Another clash of horns can actually hear the sounds of the horns hitting together. Some skipping and jumping. And that, I think, is that. I'll try reposition one more time, just to see whether they're going to continue with their sparring. And while we do, listening to the constant sound of the cuckoo, and I've decided that can be our collective noun for cuckoos. When they're here, it is a constant of cuckoos. Constant. That red-chested cuckoo has not stopped. Oh. Break for dinner, everybody. Stopping to have a snack and a groom. Now, if this were a really serious rutting period, they would not have stopped. They would have continued until a victor was found. Oh, posturing again. Two boys sizing each other up. One of them, the one on the left, is actually not all that interested. He'd actually really rather have some dinner before it gets too dark. And the other one agrees. Okay. Our impala are done for now. We're going to move on and see what else we can find. Oh, that sunset just keeps getting... Sorry, look at the colours. That is absolutely spectacular. It's nice every now and again to remind oneself to stop and take in the sunset. We sometimes find ourselves rushing around with lions, with leopards, with all sorts of things. And it's nice every now and again just to stop and have a, a moment to reflect on exactly where we are and how beautiful it is. Don't you agree, Impala? No, probably not. I suppose if we give a waterbuck a collective noun, we probably need a collective noun for Impala as well. But I'm drawing a blank there, I'm afraid. An I, an M, an in, an intimation, no. And, no, that's me. I was about to say an irritation of Impala, but they're not irritating at all. And Starry Night, you say, should be a flicker of an impala. I love that. A flicker of impala. That
that is a lovely idea. I like that, a flicker of impala. Uh, given the, the glorious nature of the sunset, Byron cannot tear himself away. Let's go and have another look. I can't, everybody. We're trying to do a bit of a time lapse here at the moment with Jandre. There's a vehicle coming behind us. I'm just going to move Jandre. Is that all right? It's <laughs> oh, death to time lapse, unfortunately. Sorry. I'm just move out the way and let this other vehicle drive past. See what they've got. Who knows all what they've seen? Let's, let's be friendly and wave. <laughs> And we can still watch the beautiful sunrise. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hello. How are you? All right. Fine, man. Good. Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good. Good. We're in the sunset. Yes. Yes. We live, and people from all over the world are enjoying our sunset with us. Yeah. 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 All right. Enjoy. Yeah. Lovely seeing you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon? Can you put us on the TV? On the TV, sure. <laughs> 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 bye, bye, everyone. It's always wonderful to see guests uh, out on safari, enjoying the safari and enjoying the sunset too. And it's lovely and you see everybody just really having a wonderful time. It's great. I suppose it's almost uh, spotlight time. Oh, see what we can find. All right. Oh, that was beautiful. It's amazing how quickly the color just changed. And it was that beautiful pink and purple and um, I'm glad Jamie also got to see and witness the sunset all right let's start putting some lights on here oh, again you know this is that I always call it that awkward time of the evening because it's it's not quite spotlight dark yet it's almost dark enough for the spotlight rather and it's not quite light enough that we can use our eyes very well but um, who knows let's see Wow, so one of our viewers has given us an interesting answer to the vulture question on how long they can live. And apparently in South America, um, they've got something called a king vulture. And that vulture can live up to 30 years, which is very, very interesting. Now, I wonder what the length of uh, or the lifespan of some of these African vultures. I had a look. It's got nothing on the app that I've got, so I don't know. We'd have to have a look. And I wonder if those aren't vultures in captivity or if they are wild vultures. Now, the interesting thing is vultures are actually, there are two categories of vultures. Old school, uh, no, not old school, sorry. <laughs> old world vultures and new world vultures. And, um, and the what we have in Africa is old world vultures which means they rely on their eyesight to find food but um, the new world vultures which are found in South America actually actually rely on scent to find carcasses and to feed on uh, on different animals because uh, I wonder if that vehicle has got anything there I just saw a vehicle stop, just wanted to make sure and see if they had anything. Let's see what else we've got around here in the trees. So, um, and it makes sense for the South American vultures to have evolved that way because they're flying through thick canopies and thick trees and forests. So they can't necessarily rely on their eyesight to find carcasses or soaring around. So they rely on their sense of smell. Chandra, one chameleon coming up. I hope. <laughs> it's a lovely temperature now. It's cooled down quite a bit, which is great. 
Wonder what happens if we spot a woodland kingfisher at night. Does it count? <laughs> Uh, Bree, you say some of the other guides that you, uh, that are here at the moment enjoy the sunrise safaris. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, it's always difficult, and people often ask me that question. I don't know. I, I do enjoy the mornings, the cooler mornings, and driving around. Um, but um, yeah, it's a difficult question. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I do enjoy the mornings, but the afternoons are nice. I think generally the afternoons are a little bit more laid back, if I can say that. They, uh, it's not always a guarantee that you're going to see too much activity with animals, especially in the summer when it is uh, when it is much warmer. Um, animals do tend to rest a bit more, but. Um, but yeah, you know, and the mornings are nice. It's nice and cool, and it's nice to to enjoy the the morning safari and the cool weather. And usually, you get more activity from animals. So I don't know. I, yeah, but I enjoy both. You know, I suppose you get to have sundowners in the afternoon. <laughs> it's the one benefit of an afternoon or sunset safari. Christine and you say you've never seen a sunset that compares to sun or any sunset around the world that compares oh yeah, I think I'm seeing things but hang on um, you say sorry Christine you were saying that you can't you haven't seen a sunset that compares to the South African sunsets You know, I think I am seeing things, everyone, but and now it's very difficult to try and spot with the spotlight and my binoculars. I thought I saw something that almost resembled a chameleon, but uh, no, it's just a leaf. It's just a leaf. Sure, it looked almost like a little tail, and it is difficult at times to spot especially with these green lush green leaves at the moment anyway that was just something that we've got to keep looking out for so christine now i think i agree um you know christine those beautiful sunsets that we have here and you say you haven't seen one anywhere else in the world as beautiful as a south african sunset i think in southern africa in general we've got amazing sunsets even in botswana um, over the okavango delta you get amazing amazing sunsets but definitely you know we are very very fortunate and blessed to have these amazing sunsets all right, let's head over to Jamie. I'm sure she's got the spotlight out and let's see if she can find something. Well, Byron is not alone in his search for chameleons. I have not seen one chameleon this year and I'm starting to feel slightly bereft. We didn't actually see that many of them last year either, so it would be a really nice way to end off a lovely sunset safari. And actually, the sunset, I think, was the highlight of the sunset safari this evening. Now, hopefully, we can add a chameleon to that list of highlights. I'm scouring the bushes. Oh, easy peasy, it's something that we should always get into the habit of doing, I think, is to try and describe the, the way that the air smells. And yes, there is a very different scent to the evening um, than there is during the day, particularly in summer, because a lot of the plants, the scents of the various flowers come through even more vividly than they might during the day and yes the the bush is filled with the smell of plants you only really smell potato something called a potato bush at night a potato bush tip there 
potato bush potato bush um, you only you'll only get the flowers opening at night and they release that incredible scent that smells exactly like cooking potatoes so every now and again we'll go through this this patch where you can just smell cooking potatoes and you start looking around thinking that perhaps you might be closer to camp than you realize but it is just in fact a plant Winter is a winter doesn't smell as different at night, but it does still smell a little bit different. There's a very cool edge to the air. I think my favorite smell though of all time in terms of the smells of the bush in summer is those evenings when the thunderstorms start to close in. And just before they hit, even before they hit, sorry Impala. Just going to dim my lights for them. Even before they hit, you start getting the incredible smell of petrichor in the air. And then at the same time, you've got this buildup of humidity, this electric feeling in the air. And that is my one of my favorite, favorite things about the bush. Personally, my favorite time of day, of any season, whether it's winter or summer, is first thing in the morning. That's my favorite time, just as the sun is coming up. But an African summer evening has a very close second, or comes a very close second. I don't know if that spectacular sunset perhaps is bringing some rain with it. The clouds have been coming and going all day today. It would be very nice if perhaps it decided to bring some rain along with it. Chameleon? No? Chameleon? No? Chameleon? No. I am hopeful though. It would be really very pleasant to finish off. With any nocturnal creature actually. Any nice surprise. Perhaps a genet, porcupine, dare I hope. I kept saying porcupine the last time I drove around during these evenings. Is that infrared meant to be on? Oh, it's working. It is. It's oh. working just fine. There we go. <laughs> well, that's good news. VM, VM was quite surprised that it was working, but it is definitely. Aha. Now, Aqua, you've asked a very serious question, a very, very serious answer. Aqua would like to know what is the collective noun for safari guides at a safari live. Well, Aqua, I think that might depend upon who you ask and what kind of a day you ask it on. Um, what would be a good, I'm trying to think of a good collective noun for our combination, but I, I'm struggling to come up with one that is all encompassing. Um, an idiosyncrasy of safari live guides perhaps is one. Um, an oh, I know, an eccentricity of a safari live guides. How's that? An insect in <laughs> an eccentricity of safari live guides. Perhaps our lovely directors would like to contribute their thoughts. Perhaps they wouldn't. Perhaps we don't want to know. Okay, Fran, I thought about it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, the, th the, th the thought crossed my mind. Fran has said an asylum of safari guides. Okay, fair enough. I, that was actually my first thought, but I, I ducked around it. But Fran, Fran was on the same page. An asylum of safari live guides. <laughs> I'm glad to know we keep you thoroughly entertained and that you've got a jolly good impression of our sanity. Uh, let's go over to Byron so that perhaps he can comment on what he thinks the collective noun for Safari Live Guides should be. A collective noun of Safari Live Guides? Uh, sure, I don't know. Um, Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to give it some thought. Sorry, I'm just having a look. We saw a, saw a bush baby, everyone, that I wanted to show you, but it jumped away very quickly. But it is, in, I think it's in a tree somewhere. I'm just trying to have a look. 
Uh, very, very agile and they don't sit around for very long. Oh, it's such a pretty, beautiful little bush baby that was in that tree. Uh, it seems to have moved off, hiding away from us. Let's see if we can find another one. Have a look. I still haven't seen any sign of a, a chameleon at all. What about a cacophony of? guides, or a cacophony of safari live guides, because we tend to speak quite a bit, don't we? <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. I can't think of anything else right now. I think an asylum is prob probably quite a good one. <laughs> an asylum of guides. Jen and a few others will say a circus of guides. Oh, perhaps. <laughs> I wonder who'd be the biggest clown. <laughs> and you're more than welcome to answer if you'd like. <laughs> Tammy, you wanted to know if our bush babies that we see out here are anything close or related to the raccoons that you get back home. No, not at all. These are nocturnal little primates, so they're completely different to raccoons. Not related to a raccoon at all. They're tiny little primates that jump around at night from tree to tree, um, and they are strictly nocturnal. They don't move around during the day. Um, but very very shy incredibly fast once they start getting their metabolism going and warming up in the evening They start jumping around and they move incredibly quickly and they can jump Amazing distances for their body size Which is awesome to see But again when you you do need to look very very hard to see them to know what is a, a bush baby baby called uh, <laughs> oh there's a little scrub head just off to the side let's have a look here quickly a uh, little one little 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 one um, now bush baby baby oh baby baby <laughs> <What are you? laughs> um, let me try to find it for you quickly Nicole let me try to see I'm actually not sure um, I know these little ones, the scrub hairs, the little scrub hairs are called leverets. That's the name of these tiny, tiny scrub hairs. Sorry, I'm trying to look and shine at the same time. There, it's just moving off. All right, I don't want to shine on it for too much longer. Sorry, I'm just, uh, just uh, let me have a look here quickly and see if I can find these little bush babies and see if there's anything on here. Let's just read quickly. Um, uh, and they just refer to them as young. They don't have a specific name for them. And have a look. Oh, look at that beautiful face of that bush baby. Those big, big eyes, big ears, perfect for nocturnal animals. But isn't that cute? Wow. <laughs> um, so they just refer to it as young. And Nicole, I haven't heard of another term. We do have a thick tailed bush baby, that one over there, which we see occasionally, or the greater bush baby. And. Um, and we do not 
oh, um, we do get them around here but we do not see them very often they are much much larger now if I can sh try and show you quickly let me just put that down now the greater bush baby is probably about this big it's quite big everyone if you think of that size for a bush baby about that and these little ones the lesser bush baby is um, is probably about about that that, that big uh, about that big <laughs> very very small very very small little creatures um, so Nicole I'm not sure of a name for a, a baby bush baby Oh baby, baby. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should start seeing some Britney Spears. How would that go down? <laughs> um, but I'm not sure. So if anybody else knows um, or has found an answer, please let us know. It's interesting, but I'm not sure what it's called. Still searching the trees very, very carefully for any sign of chameleons or scorpions or maybe even a genet or a civet. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we've been able to find a chameleon this evening, everyone. But um, for a wonderful afternoon, a full afternoon. I hope you have all enjoyed it as much as I have, certainly. And thank you to Jandre on camera with me. Thanks, Jandre. And we tomorrow morning again. Safari. Let's head back to Jamie, and she can say goodbye. Good night and goodbye, everyone. I couldn't agree more with Byron that it has indeed been a wonderful afternoon. And whilst Byron hasn't managed to find a chameleon, we've still got three minutes to go, so you never know, we might just get lucky. And while we've been trundling along, I've been thinking, well, since you were wondering about a collective noun for safari guides, or at least safari live safari guides, perhaps I should try and think of a, a collective noun for all of our viewers. And I have to be honest, it's a difficult one. That's a very difficult one. A value of viewers. I know it doesn't have to be alliterative, but I think a value kind of describes exactly, not in, not in monetary terms, just in, in terms of what it is you all bring to our safaris as well. I'll have to think about it and come up with an answer for tomorrow. My brain's... My brain's relatively fried and I completely sympathize with Byron's inability to say bush baby baby. Bush baby baby, bush baby baby, bush baby baby, bush baby baby. Ha! <laughs> Sorry, Daisy's place. Ah, Daisy's place has gone for the slightly less, um, slightly less of a reference to our our eccentricities, and has said that it should be called a book of guides. I like that, like a guidebook, but a book of guides. That's really nice, Daisy's place. Thank you. Oh, hello, Impala. Sorry. <laughs> That's also really lovely from Alina. Alena, you say, since we're all so in love with the wildlife, could it not be a smitten of guides? Well, I think that's a really very good way of describing exactly how we all feel about the life that we lead out here. We may view things differently, we may have different favorites and different um, specialities, but it's safe to say, it's a very safe bet to say that we are all 100% smitten with the life we lead. Of course, one last thing we need to do is come up with a collective down for the cameraman. A talent of cameraman, perhaps, or a dedication of cameraman. I'll have to give some more thought to this particular subject because I'm r rapidly running out of time and my brain isn't quite working fast enough for the demands. 
And so we reach the end of what has been a truly lovely sunset safari. And thank you all for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the back of the vehicle with us. For now, it's time to do our final goodbyes and our thank yous. So a big thank you to VM, as always, for his wonderful camera work and to Eggsy in Abstentia, um, since he has since walked home with Herbie. <laughs> I was met by VM on the road, as well as to Rebecca and Jerry in Final Control for keeping us thoroughly entertained and in control and a big thank you to all of you watching us around the world i hope that you had as much fun as we did and i hope that we will see you on the sunrise safari tomorrow morning bye bye everybody